Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Ways of Working, a virtual symposium on the archive of the late, great Professor Sir Robert Edwards, formerly a fellow here at Churchill College. Um, my name is Alan Packwood. I'm lucky enough to be the director of the Churchill Archive Centre, and I'm going to be acting as your master of ceremonies. This is a Churchill Archive Centre event held as part of the Cambridge Festival. It would not be happening without the generous support of our sponsors, the Edward Steptoe Research Trust, the London Women's Clinic Foundation, ReproSoc, Cambridge Reproduction, Theramex, Dr. Byme, and Progress Educational Trust. The event also would not be happening without the hard work of Madeline Evans, one of our archives assistants, uh, sorry, one of our archivists, um, who you will meet in a moment and who has been its driving force. It's due to her that we are now gathered on online for what was originally going to be a physical gathering, cancelled unfortunately just as we entered lockdown. And in the course of the next three hours, we're going to facilitate a series of conversations highlighting the myriad ways in which the Edwards collection can be used to inform and inspire, inform research, education, art, science, and biography. Um, one of the themes that has already emerged just in, in chatting to some of the panelists beforehand is that this is a truly interdisciplinary approach, an interdisciplinary event, and as such, directly reflects um, the sort of approach and the sort of research pioneered by Bob Edwards. Now, I'm not an embryologist, biologist, or, or even a scientist. Um, and my job this afternoon is to try and give you some context and to keep things running to time. Um, first, I, I suspect that most of our speakers will refer to Professor Edwards simply as Bob, because that is how everyone knew him. Secondly, for those of you who are not already familiar with the man and his work, let me give you very quickly some of the highlights. Bob was born in Yorkshire in 1925 to a working class background. He was educated in Manchester. Um, he, after a dalliance with agriculture, he um, obtained a degree in zoology from University College of North Wales in Bangor. Um, he then went on to do a PhD at the University of Edinburgh in their Institute of Animal Genetics and Embryology. Um, and he developed an interest initially in animal reproduction. He worked for a year at the California Institute of Technology, then at the National Institute for Medical Research in London. And he became interested in working on human fertilization. He moved to Cambridge University in 1963, and in 1968, he began a collaboration on in vitro fertilization with Oldham gynecologist, Dr. Patrick Steptoe and nurse and embryologist, Jean Purdy. And that led 10 years later, after much hard work and um, after um, quite considerable um, 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 controversy and overcoming um, considerable obstacles to the birth of Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, in 1978. Thereafter, the team set up the world's first center for IVF treatment at Bourne Hall. Bob was a professor, an editor, a writer, a campaigner, a counselor, a teacher, a research director, and a father. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology in 2010, was knighted in 2011, and sadly passed away in 2013. Now those are just some of the facts. We're going to flesh out a lot of that detail um, with color and controversy as we move through the afternoon. The Bob Edwards archive is 141 boxes of personal and scientific papers, including correspondence, research materials, laboratory notebooks, drafts and journal articles, newspaper clippings, photographs, videos, and film. It's been deposited by the family, accepted for the nation by the government as a preeminent collection and catalogued with the aid of a Wellcome Trust grant. It sheds light on the science and also on the ethical debates around the science. It illuminates the research process 
and the characters involved in making IVF happen. We've tried to break this afternoon down into easily digestible chunks, conversations and presentations. The program um, should now have been posted in Zoom chat, and that program contains detailed biographies of our speakers. So I will keep my introductions of them brief, and you can find out more about them by going to the program in Zoom chat. Our first conversation this afternoon is about how you go about using the material in the Edwards Archive for research. And our two panelists might best be described as a home team. Madeleine Evans is the archivist who's catalogued the collection and knows it better than any other member of the Archive Centre team. Nick Hopwood is Professor of History of Science and Medicine here at Cambridge in the Department of the History and Philosophy of Science and has been one of the first researchers to actually utilize the collection as a research resource. And he's working on the history of in vitro fertilization. So without further ado, over to Nick and to Madeline. Well, hello, Madeline. Um, I think the first thing to say is, is, a, is again, thank you um, on, on behalf of researchers uh, for the tremendous job of cataloging that you've done. I mean, the clarity of organization and the level of detail is absolutely wonderful, and it makes it very easy to search for whatever one might be interested in. Then maybe I can start by asking you, how did the papers come to Churchill College? Oh, well, so the story goes back to 2008, when Alan had a meeting with Bob Edwards who'd expressed an interest in depositing his papers at the Archive Centre. So also present at that meeting were Ruth Edwards, Bob's wife, uh, Kay Elder, who will speak later today, and Martin Johnson, who was one of Edwards' research students, former research students. And so after that meeting, the next step was for Archive Centre staff to survey the records in situ. So this involved um, teams from the Archive Centre going to the family home and also to Bourne Hall to get a sense of the type of material which would make up the archive and also how large the archive would be. Um, after that, the archive arrived at the Archive Centre in 14 different accessions or groups of materials. And these are a complete different range of sizes and they arrived between 2010 and 2018 and they came from the family but also from Bourne Hall. Um, the largest accession of these was 68 boxes which arrived in 2014 and as Alan mentioned the whole archive is 141 boxes so that was quite a large a large portion, portion. and that came from Jenny Joy who's one of the Edwards daughters. Um, so also in 2014, 21 hardback notebooks came from Bourne Hall, and these were the clinical research notebooks, uh, which record the 10 years of research leading up to the success of IVF. So that was another important accession that arrived in 2014. Thanks. And would it be right to say that these documents represent primarily Bob Edwards's working life? Yes, primarily his working life. There is, of course, a bit of crossover. Um, for example, there's some letters that he wrote to his wife, but they were really describing his work in great detail. And then there's letters which were work letters, but which had a bit of personal detail and information in there as well, because it's really hard to completely separate somebody's working and personal life. But mainly it does focus on his work from the 1950s onwards. That makes sense. And of course, mm -hmm. as many here will know, um, Mrs. Edwards, Ruth Fowler, was a, a, a scientist yes. in, in the field in her own right. So, of course, there's a lot of discussion there. How did you set about the, the cataloguing? You've got all these boxes. What did you do next? <laughs> so, yes, um, to start with, it's important to get an overview of the collection of what kind of thing is, is in those boxes. Um, and I wasn't present at all those surveys. So, so I basically went through the collection box by box, just looking in them, getting a sense of what was there, but also creating a list of what was in those boxes, just a rough list. Um, so once you had that, the next step was to 
work on the intellectual arrangement. So, um, so I took that box list and using a table in Word, um, just arranged the files into categories such as correspondence or press cuttings or photographs, and then organize those files within the categories. Um, so archivists try to keep original order as much as possible within the files and within the collection, but also to make that structure understandable and usable by researchers who are gonna come along later. And I also uh, maintain some work that Jenny Joy, one of the Edwards daughters, had already done on the archive. Um, so you can see her arrangement in sections of the correspondence sections. Yeah, I think we'll come to those later, but um, mm -hmm. what, what particular challenges did you face in, in doing this? What made this a, a, a special uh, archive for, for you to catalogue? Yeah, so the particular challenges, um, one of them was when I came to the scientific photographs and slides, and it was actually identifying what were on those photographs and slides. Um, so I needed to brush up on my basic embryology, really, um, to be able to identify stages of egg maturation and fertilization to actually be able to describe these items properly. So researchers would be able to know what, what is actually there. Um, and also on photographs, I had help from Jenny Joy and Caroline Blackwell to identify people and places in some of the other photographs. Um, one of the other challenges were those clinical research notebooks that I mentioned, because those and also letters from women who were volunteering to take part in the clinical research trials for IVF, they, they're a really important and interesting part of the collection, but they're full of personal details and uh, things that would have to be closed under data protection. So I needed to figure out how to how to convey the information in these in these items, but without um, breaking data protection legislation. So <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge, but I tried to overcome that by um, including information in the catalogue, such as for the, so for example, for the letters which women were writing to volunteer to take part in the clinical research trials, um, I would, say how many women were writing and which countries they were writing from, um, but of course not including any identifying information there. We'll come back to, to some of those issues, but, but tell me, what did you find especially interesting? Um, so I found the range of collaborations that Edwards had really interesting. So not just the key collaborations, which were with Jean Purdy, the nurse and embryologist, and Patrick Steptoe, the medical doctor and pioneer of laparoscopy, but there were also all these other small collaborations. So for example, with uh, Guy Abraham at Harbour General Hospital in California, and Purdy visited him to investigate follicular fluid in 1969, and then Ken Fotherby at Hammersmith Hospital carried out tests on follicular fluid samples in 1970, and then there was Esther Jones at Birmingham University who collaborated with Edwards on modeling ovarian follicle dynamics. Um, but there were lots more of these small collaborations and I think it's the archive shows the importance of scientific collaboration. I found that that was very interesting. And also um, Edwards trip to the Johns Hopkins Medical School in Baltimore in 1965. Um, that seemed to be a key trip because he was able to experiment on human eggs there, which was a bit difficult in the UK at the time. And he also met um, Howard and Georgiana Jones there for the first time, and they became the pioneers of IVF in the US. So that was quite a key trip, I think, for him. Yes, I think it was. Mm. Do you have a, a favorite item in the I, archive? <laughs> well, I have a couple of favorites and I'll just, um, share my screen to show you one of these. Okay. So this is one of my favorite items. Um, it's a photograph of Robert Edwards, Patrick Steptoe, um, Leslie Brown holding Louise Brown, who was the first baby born through IVF, and Jean Purdy. And it was taken at Louise Brown's first birthday party in July, 1979. And I like it because the team's all together and it also shows how 
the research really impacted on people's lives. And another of my favourite uh, items, or a few favourite items, is a series of letters that, um, that Edwards wrote back to his wife, Ruth, from that research trip to Baltimore. And he just describes his research in great detail, but also the letters show how excited he was about the research that he was carrying out. Oh, that's great. And and that is a lovely informal photograph that's mm. in some ways it's a compliment to the, the famous shot in the hospital of, of the team uh, yeah. minus uh, Leslie Brown. So it's mm -hmm. it, it's very nice. Yeah, one, one year on. And you can see um, that photograph and the letters and lots more besides in the online exhibition. There should be a link to that in the chat box for the audience. Okay, great. So now I'm going to ask you, Nick. Um, so you worked on the Edwards papers in summer 2019. So w why was that? What were you looking for? Well, I I'm finishing a book that I'm, I'm calling Visible Embryos, A History of Human Development. And in vitro culture changes visual images significantly. And Bob Edwards was an important, really important producer of photographs of eggs and embryos. Mm. More specifically, and, and the main reason that I was there is that I'm researching a book, uh, The Many Births of the Test Tube Baby, about claims to human in vitro fertilization, mainly between the 1940s and the 1970s. So that tries to understand that achievement in terms of the changing relations between media science and journal science. So I was keen, um, as you know, I think more than keen to get into the Edwards archive as soon as it opened. Um, no, that's great. So how did you, when you were there, how did you approach your research? Well, because I, I read the instructions on the, the website, the first thing I do, did was to pack uh, half a dozen pullovers into um, one of my panniers. I mean, I do feel the cold, but um, the archive centre is not warm. And I, I found that most days, even this was the summer, I, I needed all of my layers. But, but the other thing that I did was to consult the Cambridge Manuscripts catalogue, then called Janus and now uh, uh, called Archive Search. Mm -hmm. And so I looked up the, the EDWS uh, 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 papers and maybe we can zoom in on the collection mm -hmm. uh, organisation and, and went through these, these 20 divisions uh, seeing what uh, what files I, I, I wanted to order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next we're going to pick out some of those major categories. So the first one is correspondence there, and it's the largest single category with 37 boxes. So what could you uh, let our audience know is in there for researchers to have a look at? Well, it's it's mostly general, pretty much chronologically organized. And in many ways, it's the, the usual mix of uh, asking for help, uh, giving help, um, discussing ideas, practical matters, academic gossip. It's a, it, it's a, it's a whole mix. Um, but then there are those bundles that I, I think I understood correctly, it was Jenny Joy pulled out on mm -hmm. on particular uh, topics and so so one was uh, legal um bob edwards did keep his solicitors quite busy um defending himself uh and and i suppose also managing his reputation in a in a high profile and, and rather controversial field there's also a um a, a, a set of uh, papers uh, on, on publicity um, which really took off in, in late 1965 and, of course, included the major global news story that, that, that was Louise Brown. So there are interactions with journalists, editors, photographers, television people. There's also a small um, section on Patrick Steptoe, um, which is useful because he has no uh, archive of his own. Um, it's useful even though it's, it's not that large. And I think more generally, it's maybe worth making the point that, um, like any large collection, uh, this one is really useful for researchers who are studying other people than Bob Edwards, um, especially because you've catalogued it so thoroughly and there are so many searchable names. Oh, that's, yeah, that's good to hear. <laughs> Definitely useful for, for science, 20th century science in general. 
Um, so next we come to the research and work papers and there's 16 boxes of these. So what's in there for researchers? Well, there are research notebooks um, for, from Edinburgh, the, the PhD and other work, um, the year in Glasgow in, in 1963, um, which Bob Edwards always felt was when he'd really pioneered stem cells. Um, early Cambridge work and loose sheets going into the 1970s. Um, there's, there's stuff about funding and other practicalities, uh, material and ethics and the law. And then there are the clinical notebooks that you mentioned before, linked mm -hmm. with the, the patient correspondence in the correspondence section. Now, Martin Johnson and Kay Elder had advanced access to these, as also to other documents that they were instrumental in collecting. And they reported the results of their analysis in a symposium in Reproductive Biomedicine and Society Online in 2015. Now those, um, those notebooks are closed uh, until the 2050s, I think it is. Um, now, some of us, as, as you know, have seen that as perhaps a little excessive. Um, I, I don't suppose anything could be done there, perhaps by by redacting them in a way that would keep them meaningful? Well, yes, actually, I mean, as you know, I tried to describe these in as much detail as possible to give people access um, to the information and the closures are based on sort of data protection legislation. Um, but we are now looking at digitizing these items and redacting them. So that's the clinical research notebooks and also the letters uh, from women volunteering to take part in, in the clinical research. Um, so we're able to do this work from the sponsorship from today's event actually, because putting this event online wasn't going to need as many funds as the uh, physical event would have needed. And the sponsors have kindly agreed to allow us to use the funds to make the archive more accessible. Um, so that's that's coming up, coming up in the, I wouldn't say near future, but in the future um, as soon as possible. That's that's great to hear, Madeline. Thank mm. you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so just moving on to the next section of the archive. Um, so this section is about conferences and travel, and Edward certainly went to a lot of conferences. Um, so what can you tell us about this section? No, he did travel a lot. I mean, he was mm -hmm. what, what they sometimes used to call an airport professor, um, mm -hmm. who also very often had a higher car waiting. Um, I, I think there's lots to learn here, but, but, but certainly one uh, important thing is about the communities that uh, Bob Edwards was part of, um, that he joined and in several cases uh, did an enormous amount to create. So, so I think there's a lot of interest there. Yeah, well, that's great. So the next section we'll move on to is about Edwards publishing his work. So about his papers and books, and this is eight and a half boxes. Is there something interesting there for researchers? That there are drafts type scripts, uh, mm -hmm. correspondence, um, perhaps not as many uh, referees reports as might be typical today, that they were used less then. Um, and there are some interestingly robust uh, defenses of his work when, uh, when Edwards felt that um, an editor hadn't, uh, or, or referees, uh, hadn't got the point. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay. So next, there's a section of press cuttings, uh, which is six boxes worth, and then some other publicity papers, just half a box. So, yeah, so the, they, yeah, they really complement the, um, the, the the correspondence about the publicity. Um, and my experience, I mean, having spent a lot of time doing uh, uh, undirected blanket searches through uh, runs of periodicals, is that that this is this is still uh, useful if you've even if you've already done that um, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the ways that things came into the archive that there are uh, or into his papers originally um, you, you can get insights into what happened around publication sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay great um, and then Edwards wasn't just a scientist and public figure he was also an editor and publisher wasn't he? He, he was actually and very very active. I mean, 
he started, as far as I know, with um, the news sheet, uh, research and reproduction um, put out by the International Planned Parenthood Federation, um, Alan Parks, uh, one of his mentors uh, persuaded him to, to take that on. Um, but then uh, there, there's also um, a, a set of boxes on the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology that include uh, three boxes about the journal Human Reproduction. Um, as some will know, uh, there was a, a bit of a row uh, about uh, Edward's wish to take that journal away from Oxford University Press, um, leading to his breaking with that society and the journal. So at the age of 75, he started uh, reproductive biomedicine uh, online, um, and, and there, are, uh, there, there are boxes about that as well. So, so there, there's mm -hmm. a lot of interest there. Definitely. Now, you, you mentioned before that um, you'd received some, uh, some boxes from Bourne Hall, uh, mm -hmm. the clinic. Could you just say a little bit um, as we near, near the end of our chat about what's in those? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, 15 and a half boxes about Bourne Hall. Um, and quite a few of these papers actually came from the desk drawers of Edward's desk because Kay Elder inherited that desk and his office and she saved she saved those papers thankfully. Um, so some of these papers relate to the establishment of Bourne Hall Clinic. Um, some relate to treatment of patients at Bourne Hall in the early years. So Bourne Hall started in 1980. So there's records relating to treatment from 1980 to 84. And there's also correspondence with visitors to Bourne Hall, and those were mainly um, scientists and medics coming to find out about the procedures of IVF. And there's also correspondence between Edwards and staff at Bourne Hall Clinic, and then some ethical committee papers. Now, it might seem odd that these started in 1974 when the clinic didn't open until 1980, and that's just because there's some copies of ethical committee papers from Oldham where the earlier research was carried out. And we've also taken the papers up to 2001, even though Edwards actually left Bourne Hall in 1991, because we didn't want to split that series of records. Um, you've also got some uh, files with, so publication files, which are mainly reprints and off prints. Um, and then that's Patrick Steptoe, Robert Edwards files, are copies of papers, um, and also conference papers and lectures as well. And then the section of Bourne Hall events um, relate to things like uh, the Bourne Hall babies parties, which um, marked landmark figures in the numbers of babies being born after being successfully conceived through IVF at Bourne Hall. Thanks, and then just, just very yeah. briefly, it's perhaps worth um, pointing out that the papers are also rich in photographs and mm -hmm. audiovisual material, aren't they? Yes, certainly. So we've got 25 boxes of photographs, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, and these range from medical and research photographs to photographs of Edwards and award ceremonies and of IVF babies and families. So there's a real range there and included in the photograph sections, there's some slides which were actually digitized by ReproSoc, so the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, before they came to the Archive Centre. So we've got digital copies of those, which is great. And you can actually see one in the background here. Um, we have also have a section of sound recordings. So there's 49 items there, they're mainly cassette tapes. Um, and they relate to two scientific meetings at Bourne Hall, uh, so in the 90s, and then also two radio programmes, one from Oldham Hospital Radio from 1999, and then another one from BBC Radio 4, um, a episode of The Reunion featuring Edward, so that was from 2003. And those sound recordings are all digitised and were done so as part of the cataloguing project funded by the Wellcome Trust. The uh, film and video recordings are also digitised as part of the project and I'll hurry up but just to point out one section of the video recordings which I think would be particularly rich for researchers are recordings from current affairs programmes and uh, news items because they show the media and social reaction to, to topics that were sometimes controversial at the time such as 
um, experimentation on embryos or um, egg donation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, well, Nick and, and Madeline, thank you both very much for that wonderful overview um, of the archive. Um, I hope that it's whetted plenty of appetites out in the audience um, for people to come in and um, start undertaking their own research. Uh, it would also be very remiss of me if I didn't thank um, both Jenny Joy and Kay Elder for the roles they played, which you've highlighted in, in actually helping preserve this collection and get this collection to the Archive Centre. And we're going to be hearing from both of them later in the afternoon. Um, we've got just a, a, a quick moment for Q&A now. And I should say that if, during the afternoon, if you, if you have questions, use the Zoom Q&A function to submit them. Um, and I will convey them to the speakers. And we also hope at the end of the afternoon um, to, to have some, some time for, for a bit of Q&A and discussion then as well. Um, I can't see any questions at the moment, but um, I certainly have one. Um, and, and that's to, to you, Nick, really. I mean, um, you've used the, the archive for your own research as you were going through it. Um, did you um, sort of come across um, subjects, themes, um, correspondence that, that you thought lent themselves to other research projects and, and what, what were the sort of particular sort of things that, that, that you'd identified and that you might in, encourage others to investigate? I mean, clearly I had a particular interest myself in some of the, the visual aspects and in, in the, the, some of the, what was happening around uh, claims making. But I think um, as, you know, just thinking about the different categories, um, that, that Madeleine and I were talking about makes clear. Um, there are there, there's a whole range of topics on, on which it would be great to have more research. I mean, some of them might seem to be quite well studied. Uh, some of the ethical debates, for example. But I think there's there's scope using the materials in the archive to go deeper there. And I think that's also true um, with the. Uh, the relations with various uh, societies um, and, uh, and, and journals. Um, so, I mean, certainly Roger Gosden in his uh, biography does a, does a nice job on the, the controversies around Eshri and, um, and uh, the, the, the creation of uh, RBMO, but, but, but there would be more to do there, I think, and, and research in reproduction has has hardly been studied. So, so I mean, I think anyone looking through and our slides perhaps didn't convey quite the level of detail that that Madeline has achieved in um, in her descriptions. But going through those, I think um, can 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 give uh, historians uh, of science and medicine uh, really a lot of ideas for for topics to study. And talking about level of detail. Um, we've had a, a, a very specific question that's come in from Sandy Starr, um, and Sandy asks, um, I'd be interested to know whether there's anything in the archives pertaining to a particular paper in the journal Science, co-authored by Bob Edwards in early 1984, and includes a link in the Q&A. Um, Sandy says it's an interesting paper because it just predates the Warnock report, and it involved an embryo remaining technically alive for 13 days. The embryo had lost its coherence and therefore any possibility of the primitive streak appearing and wouldn't actually be considered an embryo according to present day law regulation. But that definition of an embryo hadn't yet been settled at the time. I've heard apocryphal stories about controversy surrounding this paper, but it would be good to know the actual facts. Is that something, um, Nick, that either you or Madeline have come across or is it something that we're going to need to get, get back to Sandy on with more detail? But it's not something that I recall off the top of my head, but it is, um, it's very much the kind of thing that Madeline's cataloguing would let one find fairly easily. Yes, I'd, I'd have to check. I'd be surprised if we don't have anything, though. So I think the answer then, Sandy, there is um, to follow up with Madeline um, after then, um, this afternoon, and we'll see what we can find in the archive, and this will be a, a good test case. And that leads nicely into Madeline's, I mean, 
what would you say now in terms of anyone who's listening, who, who's wanting to use the archive, what, what would you advise them in, 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 as the next steps? Um, how, how should they get in touch with you? How can they find out more about the collection? Well, they can look at our website um, to navigate to the catalogue, which they can they can take a look at. They can also um, get in touch with us through, through our email address. Um, and I'm happy to answer specific questions on the archive, such as Sandy's. Um, and normally they could book an appointment and hopefully we'll be opening up the reading room again soon. But we're also providing a certain amount of copies for free at the moment. So if people... If people are interested in that, they can also also get in touch and we can let them know more about that. So I guess looking at the catalogue and getting in touch is really the first steps. Okay, well, I mean, I think there, there would certainly be further questions, um, but I need to keep things um, moving along. Um, we're now going to home in on one particular section of the archive, the section that you referred to um, a few minutes ago, Madeline, and that's the, the photographs. Um, and I'm going to bring in two new speakers for a conversation that, that bridges the art science divide, which of course is exactly what the Cambridge Festival should be about. Sarah Franklin is Professor of Sociology here at Cambridge and founder of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, which you just heard Madeline refer to. Um, and she's now going to be joined by Gina Glover. Gina is a renowned photographic artist and co-founder of Photofusion Photography Centre in London. In 2016, she received Wellcome Foundation funding for her project Life in Glass, which uses the scientific IVF photography of Bob Edwards. Um, and Gina is going to be um, showing and talking about some of her work um, in just a moment. And of course, what, what Sarah and Gina share is an interest in the photographic images of the IVF process that form a key part of this archive. And they approach them from different, but as I think we're about to hear, very much complementary perspectives. And I think Gina, it's over to you first. Hi, welcome everybody. And it's such a privilege to be here, particularly as it, we put up, and thank you to Madeline, the exhibition which is at Churchill College literally a year ago. And there it is, and it's been sitting there in the dark. So I feel for the first time it can have life um, being at this conference. So what I'm first going to do is discuss and show um, my presentation. And then Sarah will come in and um, make comments. And I know will um, enlighten a lot of the work that I'm doing. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and hopefully I can um, find my presentation. So the exhibition um, that is on at Churchill and has also been shown at Mary Edwards is an exhibition um, which I very much collaborated and was invited um, to make with um, Sarah, but what I would like to say first is that I'm an artist, I'm not a scientist, I'm dyslectic, I left school at 15. And so really um, what my work is about is a kind of communication and an emotional response to um, making things visible or in a way that actually people can reflect on it and discuss it. Um, so, uh, I wanted to give some kind of indication of where this work started. And in fact, it's kind of ironic to think that I was invited to make work in the um, genetics unit at Kai's way back in 2003, because work had been seen of mine when I made um, a mile of artwork at Central with what they promised to me was their archive. And that archive consisted, and I didn't know when I took it on, was one envelope of like six photographs. And what I discovered there was that everybody had actually grabbed their own um, archive. And I found it in the different departments of the various um, places at Central Middlesex Hospital. So I can't tell you enough how thankful so many people will be 
that this archive of Bob's is in this amazing situation. And I just know from knowing Madeline that it will be so beautifully catalogued. And for me as an artist, God, that would be just so fantastic. Um, even at the stage of making the work that I did, because I didn't have the interpretations and a lot of it was asking people. Um, so this was the first project I did on art and science. And I realized how fascinated I was at actually seeing scientific images and what a kind of emotional impact they could have me. And as I said, I'm dyslectic. And I remember going because of this to a conference where it was uh, acknowledged that if you're dyslectic, it's on chromosome 18. And so, um, but looking at that quote in the center of Carolyn Olgaby's, I think it's just so um, important and philosophical that you can think about when you're looking at the minutiae of life. Um, so what I noticed, and I think what I want to keep addressing is the physicality and what we see and what, what we take in and how we then digest it. So what I saw in the genetics department and people working with chromosomes was that they were mad on stripy things. They had stripy ties, stripy socks, stripy this, stripy that. And so I collected their um, socks because I'm interested in collaboration and identification and people feeling personal about my work. But again, I didn't have the knowledge because I didn't know about chromosomes, a karyotype chromosome. So it wasn't until I came back with my socks displayed like this that somebody pointed their way me to the fact that such a thing called a karyotype. And of course, um, this is the karyotype I made, which um, I'm so pleased to admit that it was on the front cover of Nature and also on the cover of Sarah's book. Um, and it's in the um, Mendel Institute. But here is an example precisely of somebody who doesn't really understand the full picture, needing to be, to, to, to find things out, to actually convey the, meeting, the meaning of things. And as an artist working in science, my um, passion is to try and get that metaphor um, to be, um, profound as I can. So this is um, moves me on to um, being commissioned by Peter Brody, the guy's hospital in the U new um, unit there, IVF unit there. And what I wanted to do was actually because I felt it, my work was very much in the entrance and in all the consulting rooms and things like that. But I knew with IVF, as we all know, you know, not everybody is successful. So I didn't want to put completely sort of diagramic um, images of um, embryos. I kind of wanted to give hope and to bring nature back into it. And so this is why I chose to make these embryos and these cell divisions um, couched in blossom. And I also wanted to make something that was sort of the celebration of nature. And I think after lockdown, God, do we know, do we recognize how much it sort of kept us alive and kept us going? So in a sense, this is a celebration of it. But ah, I'd only got this, this image sort of connected to what I want. Of course, it isn't till I show it to Sarah that she said, but well, you realize, of course, that Almond Blossom was uh, this wonderful painting of um, Vincent van Gogh which he did um, and made and gave to his brother Theo as a celebration um, of the delivery of their baby son. So there again, you know, it's this uh, wonderful um, ability, wonderful fortunateness I've had in actually collaboration with people who have got so much knowledge that I can even move um, my pictures on to be more appropriate. So it was actually, because of making the work um, for Peter Brady at the in Guys that I met Sarah and Sarah really came across my work. And after that, um, I've sort of off and on and been part of the many things that she 
is involved in, um, as everybody knows here how generous Sarah is and how she gets and gathers um, so many different people from different disciplines. So here are two of the um, conferences that I attended. And that was again, really important food for me to have a much great understanding of um, Bob's work and um, the whole aspects and history um, of IVF. And this led on to also an exhibition, which is the, a bit of the exhibition that um, is on at Churchill that we produced um, in 2018 called uh, Reproductivities, Remaking Life, um, which was a collaboration um, with Sarah and with, um, with Lucy van der Weyl. So um, that actually got the work sort of to be the work and, and, and to get the funding to produce it as an exhibition. But it was actually at one of those conferences, and Sarah, I hope you'll come in to say which one it was, when Kay Elder put up this slide and it just went bing to me. It, it, there was something that just resonated um, for me and it won't be what you think it would be to resonate. I mean, there it was, it was a very yellow slide um, and I was obviously um, interested in its content but what I was particularly interested in um, was the was the indexicality of this image, the marking, the marking of the man, the marking that showed where he um, had um, selected the images to be shown at his various talks. And the reason that that resonated was because of an artist who I've been completely following all my life. Um, who has a museum to himself in Houston, Saitombi. And I'm just interested in mark making and those marks. So in a sense, okay, for you scientists, that's not where you would be looking at that image. But I think what is interesting is that when you're coming from somebody with somebody from a different discipline, how they read things. Um, and so this is an example of that. And this led me to make the art of Bob and um, these are a series of um, light boxes and it's important that they are light boxes. Um, so the images come through where I've taken his actual um, images and translated them um, with my blossom images. Um, so here is a selection of the ones that I did. Um, and on the right, you can see um, his actual image um, for the slide that I actually um, worked from. Um, and I obviously picked things out that just I found quite interesting where it said control and which probably had a different meaning to how I might be thinking of that. Um, and here it shows you um, the images that you would have seen um, so they're, this, they're being hung. And I'm moving on to, I also, as part of Life in Glass, which was the um, project that Sarah founded, was an, a sort of um, kind of residency at Bourne Hall or the ability to go to Bourne Hall and to look at their archive there. And I find this image of, you know, there is Louise Brown, there is um, her incubator. Um, just so monumental in, um, what it's about, that I felt that the project I was working with Sarah was called Life in Glass. So I then, um, assisted by Adam, um, who um, showed me all the archival sort of, all the, the glass um, equipment that they had in Bourne Hall. And as a photographer, I was having to do it terribly quickly. The lighting was atrocious. It was completely yellow and revolting. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do about this? But then I realized, of course, what you do is because what, as an artist, what you're trying to do is to do something that actually shifts the one-to-one -one relationship of what you're looking at. And so these I've um, uh, inverted um, to make them into these uh, blue images. And so I've selected, and there was many more I could show you, of um, the collection that is at um, Bourne Hall.
And so here we come to um, the, one of the um, first actual um, black and white images um, of Bob's, um, which um, in fact is interesting as a photographer because it's sort of scratched and um, marked and not touched and everything. And of course, the way that I'm looking at it is not for the selection of an embryo. I'm looking at it as a sort of visual thing to look at. Um, and I found this just such an exciting image that I was kind of wondering what I would do with it. And I decided that I would make these images into, um, first of all, my experiment was to make them into salt um, prints based on um, the process of um, the founder of photography, Henry Fox Talbot. And, um, and then later to use them as blueprints. And what is interesting, um, which you probably don't know, is that when you're making blueprints, cyanotype prints, and you, you're using these chemicals, that they are very vulnerable in terms of how, not vulnerable, but it's difficult to get consistency is because of how much light, um, how strong the sun is, um, the degree of humidity, the temperature, all these kinds of things actually affect the process, which I felt was um, very applicable um, to the images that I was actually um, using and making. Um, and so what I did for the exhibition, and so these, I've scanned the photograph, I made it in, as, a, as, as a vinyl um, image, which I could lay on the um, cyanotype, a transparency sort of large negative. And I've also then um, used the um, chemistry that is used in IVF to protect the gamut. So I've mixed those together. I've also used lab equipment with the images and I collected some dried flowers um, from Vaughan Hall. And I've, so what these images are now, they're much bigger. They, they originated as um, sort of 10 by eight or not A4 images and they're nice and big now. And then very quickly, just this isn't in the exhibition, but the way I worked and the exhibition I had at Reaper uh, that I did with Sarah Murray Edwards was in fact to um, use this amazing text, which Lucy um, had written about how she imagined her eggs. And that I find just so stimulating. When I, when I um, imagine my eggs, I think of them as gray and shiny, et cetera. But it was so powerful in me that in fact, I decided to imagine my eggs as it were, put them under a magnifying glass and use um, sweet peas. And then later um, to make them on velvet um, as hollyhocks, um, using hollyhocks to make my image. And then finally, I is a very playful, I do a lot of quite playful things to kind of experiment and see and to learn and, and, and to make things. So here I'm using poppy seeds with the equipment that I was lent or given um, from Bob Hall, from, from Bourne Hall, uh, Bob Hall, Bourne Hall. And um, I think it's interesting to see the images that I was trying out, Sarah then picked and used um, and changed um, for a lot of the um, publicity that she was uh, and, and, and seminars that she was involved in. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Gina. It's always such a delight to hear you speak about your work and it's always so hard to know where to begin. Um, to respond as there's just so many dimensions of the way that you um, translate. Uh, you use your photographs as a means of translating uh, between scientific work and the scientific imagination and, and scientific images and scientific techniques and scientific equipment and all of the other uh, dimensions of how we understand the objects of scientific inquiry, whether they're genes, or cells or embryos um, or the media uh, that's used for all of those um, all of those investigations. And I just wanted to start out um, by coming right back to the beginning where you started in the um, 
genetics laboratory where obviously um, you were looking at how um, genes or, or more particularly chromosomes are represented in, in the lab and, and you weren't even aware when you started that there is a formal <laughs> means of representation that's used in a cytogenetics lab, which is the karyotype. And yet you picked up right away the patterned nature of representation, the patterned nature by which um, chromosomes are analyzed by genetics in the lab and then you know, from the very beginning, you translated that into a much more homely idiom of washing on the line. And I think running through your work is this very rich ability to remind us both that geneticists wash their socks at home as well and have an interest in stripy socks because it reminds them of their work and their children. Um, and the, the way in which those um, mean something to people in a more ordinary way. We might get information about a gene, like for example, the dyslexia gene in a technical scientific expertise manner, but what it's gonna mean to people is in relation to their daily life. Um, and you, you know, you, your work is so effective, I think, not only at bridging that gap, but um, using that connection to, to remind us of um, all the ways in which we might say um, the facts of life come to be quite ordinary at the same time that they're in the midst of such a huge scientific transformation. Um, so in the piece you did for Guys, for the Assisted Conception Unit in Guys, which is when I first met you, in autumn 2009, um, <laughs> on the 11th floor, is it? The 11th floor of the tower where it's you had recent, recently installed your, and I had done an ethnography um, in that unit um, pr prior to that, quite a long time prior to that, actually in, in, in 2005, 2006, I had done an ethnography with Peter Brody and I was so struck um, by the way that your photographs um, captured the experiences of the people who were visiting those labs. And I remember the very first time I walked into that uh, clinic and I, and I saw your artwork in the um, waiting rooms, in the labs, in the examination rooms, in the reception area, in the entrance area when you step out of the elevator and I remember thinking it instantly changed what that clinic felt like to have your images there because your images represented the space in between all of the very technical information that people in the clinics and the labs were able to use to um, offer assistance to people seeking fertility. Um, fertility treatment, um, and yet also they were able to capture all of the emotional um, dimensions of, of that information because it's a difficult thing to convey why highly technical scientific information has such a massive emotional impact, but you capture that beautifully in your images. And at the same time, you also capture how the technicians and the clinicians and the administrators and the people working in the clinics and the labs feel about what they're doing, um, which is also um, a huge range of different kinds of emotion. And just that very basic point that these are such emotional places is so important. Um, I just wanted to mention um, something in relation to what you did with Bob's slides. Um, as you say, that came from the conference that we went to, which actually then had his successor conference in December of 2014, where Kay um, showed that slide. Um, the question we asked at that symposium, which was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in 2014, was what did Bob Edwards see when he looked at an embryo? And it's such an interesting question because the very first presentation at that 
conference was from Martin Johnson, Bob Edwards student. And I don't know if you remember, but he talked about how incredibly difficult it was to get these images because you had to stay up all night and you know you couldn't stop the experiment and have a coffee break because if you did, the cells wouldn't be in the right situation to be to be to be taken, to be put into the electron microscope or wherever else they needed to go to get recorded in order to be analyzed in order to contribute to an experiment that cost a huge amount of money and took years and years to design. And the, the sense of kind of drama, you know, of whether you were gonna get a legible image at all. Um, it was one of the main things these images conveyed to him, um, which of course is quite different to what they would convey to someone who was looking at them say diagnostically, you know, well, what do they reveal? What do they show? What can we actually see here in terms of development? And, and as you say, these also reveal the context of the sharing of that information. Who remembers slide projectors? <laughs> I remember being a lecturer when the slide projector would eat your slide and you'd panic in the middle of your talk. Um, and here he has the lettering written backwards on the underside of the slide because that's how they go in. So you can see you know, where they're supposed to go. He's color coded them probably because he used them for different um, types of presentations. And, um, and again, you know, pointing as you do to the translation, the, tra the work of translation that's happening here, um, that, that is what is involved in a scientific talk. Um, so um, just one last point about the photographs that's quite important to me. Um, you make a lot of very rich analogies in your work about um, how these images are produced, how they are communicated, how they act as translational interfaces between different types of scientific work, but also to wider audiences, how they act as an emotional interface between what is possible and what's imagined um, and, and, and so forth. And specifically the emulsion of the photograph is something that you took up in the amazing exhibit you did for the reproductivities exhibit that was um, uh, at Murray Edwards um, before it came to Churchill. And I think that your decision to um, vary the means of reproduction used to reproduce these images is a very quite brilliant comment on um, what we might call the life of these images, their liveliness, um, their suggestiveness of all the different ways we might see the same thing, which is dependent in part on the medium used to suspend the image, which is of course a very rich analogy for what happens to an embryo in a Petri dish, which is that it is made available to be viewed because it is not only being nurtured in the media, but suspended in it. Um, and glass plays a very important role in the project Life in Glass, which is ongoing because it acts as um, a means of containing something, a means of nurturing something as in a propagator or a cultivator, and a means of seeing it. Um, the very important feature of glass, in addition to the fact that it's a liquid, is that nothing or very little adheres to it. Um, so you have, in a sense, a perfect suspension medium. And the history of glass is so important to the history of um, being able to view these images. And you um, further ask us to think about suspension by your use of different media to, as it were, cultivate these images. And pretty much every photograph we took of your photographs in Murray Edwards' head, as the ones in your presentation do, reflections on <laughs> the glass, um, because Murray Edwards itself <laughs> being a huge sort of concrete and glass brutalist um, architectural establishment, it was a perfect one for that. Um, so yeah, I just want to say, um, you know, I won't say more about the links to seeds, the links to home furnishings, the incredible range of linkages you make, except to say that I don't know any other artist who has so eloquently, eloquently captured 
um, the very wide set of translational implications of, of RVF. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well thank, thank you both. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think, Sarah, um, your, your word interfaces, um, I, I think, for me, says it all. It's fantastic to see the photographs in the archive being used this way, in this way as an interface between arts and science, between academic research and wider public engagement, between the technical and, and the emotion, emotional, as you, as you brought out. Um, so I, I feel really, re very, very lucky today because I'm actually in the archive centre today. Um, and in the moment, I can walk along the corridor, I can open the door, go into the Jock Colville Hall, and I will be able to see um, your wonderful display on the walls there. Um, for everyone else who isn't with us today, you will at least be able to access the link that we placed in the Zoom chat and look at some of the, more, the images there. Um, I think we have um, had one further question come in. So this is from Surendra Paul. Um, and Surendra asks, I would like to ask Professor Flack Franklin how Robert Edwards got involved with in vitro fertilization. Um, I happened to be a second year medical student doing physiology when I heard um, um, Professor Edwards um, at a seminar at Emmanuel College describe his experiments with in vitro fertilization. He stated that it was an American PhD student who solved the problem of getting the sperm to fertilize the ovum. Um, so Sarah, are you, are you able to answer that question? Um, I mean, obviously, that's quite a big question. <laughs> it's one um, I think that will be touched on in the later session. Yeah, and one I'm not the best person come. to answer it. Um, um, but I think I do think one thing that um, has come out of the research that various of us have been doing on this area is is that it's the it's it's a set of coalescences that were shared very much by Edwards and a number of other researchers here in the UK, where there was a very unique culture of developmental biology. The the reasons for that are complicated and too much to go into here. But the result of that is that new questions about the relationship between reproduction and heredity began to be asked, and new techniques for investigating it began to be developed and IVF was first developed as a research technique, obviously before it was used clinically. Um, and it was one of many techniques that could shed new light on the relationship between reproduction and heredity. And essentially that is where Bob's interest began and developed um, alongside that of a number of other researchers. And the decision to take that to a clinical um, in a clinical direction was also shared by a significantly smaller number of researchers, but nonetheless um, was certainly something that was, was, was happening in a number of different places as, as Nick's um, showing in his work at the moment. But I think for Bob to take it in a clinical direction maybe also was because he um, was in some ways more um, iconoclastic than other researchers. He, he definitely was prepared to, um, as it were, push the boat out quite a bit further. Um, and, and so that's a little harder to explain other than maybe sort of individually, as an individual, he was very much a maverick scientist. So I hope that's helpful. You were lucky to hear him speak. I'd be interested to get your account of that talk. Uh, All right, I think, um... Um, that's wonderful, Sarah, and I think we'll be able to get other insights um, from the other speakers into um, Bob's motivations um, and um, into his working methods um, later in the afternoon. Um, we are now going to have a, a five minute um, comfort break. Um, so thank you to Gina. Thank you to Sarah. And we'll reconvene here in five minutes time. Thank you. Welcome back and do keep your questions coming um, via Q&A, even questions for the previous speakers, because we do hope to have some time at the end um, to have a, a, a more general discussion. Okay, well, um, as you've probably gathered, uh, a lot of the material in the Edwards collection is quite specialist. 
and comes with its own challenges regarding interpretation, ethics, access and use. And nowhere more so than with the clinical records and the laboratory notebooks, which you've heard Madeline and Nick talking a little bit about. Um, to sort of further discuss how this material can be mined for the benefit of research, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kay Elder, who joined the IBF team at Bourne Hall in 1984 and is now their senior research scientist, and Professor Stefan Muller-Villa um, from our Department of History and Philosophy of Science, um, who has used um, um, laboratory notebooks um, for his own research, but um, I think I'm right in saying um, largely from, the, from, the, from an earlier period. Um, but looking forward to, to hearing you both discuss um, what we might be able to get out of this material. And I think we're going to start with Stefan. Okay, so um, I'm a historian of uh, science, um, interested in questions of what I call or we call historical epistemology. Um, that's simply put, um, I'm interested in how knowledge is attained by scientists and how that knowledge uh, changes over time. I have not worked on Sir Robert Edwards, um, but um, archives of other uh, individual scientists uh, play a special role in a lot of my work. I'm interested in that work in how, before the advent of the computer, uh, scientists stored, retrieved, uh, and processed information on paper. Now, looking from that perspective on archives, you are not looking at the archives as a treasure trove of information for the contemporary historian. They are that as well, of course, uh, but as tools as paper-based machineries that scientists already used to go about in their daily business and produce uh, knowledge. And um, a lot of scientists are um, quite obsessed with uh, creating their own uh, archive. Um, so um, one example um, that um, I want to begin with uh, is the collection of off-prints uh, by uh, geneticists like Reginald uh, C. Punnett uh, and R. A. Fisher uh, that was until a few years ago part of the genetics library. Um, you see here on this slide, uh, it says on the Solanda cases, as they are called, in which the off-prints are kept, uh, keep in right order. And that uh, tells you already something about um, the collection being a kind of machinery that uh, if you upset it, it won't uh, work anymore. Um, a card catalog, um, uh, let me make this a little bit smaller. A card catalog um, uh, sorted uh, alphabetically after author indexes the holdings um, and um, uh, until um, uh, the end of uh, the 20th century, such off-print collections were a major means of uh, communication among scientists. Um, they formed a, a repository of up-to-date specialized knowledge, but they also importantly reflect the networks of contacts and collaboration among scientists. Here for the example, um, we have the author's dedication of an off-print, which was sent from Denmark by Wilhelm Johansen to Reginald Punnett. Um, and Johansen was um, the uh, Danish scientist who invented the handy word gene that we all uh, use nowadays. Um, we tried to get money um, from the Wellcome Trust uh, for cataloging and conserving this collection in 2019. Um, this was unsuccessful, and I will come back to uh, this point at the end of my uh, presentation. First, I want to uh, take you through a, a few more examples um, from my own work to show what a systematic understanding of scientists' archive, as well as attention to seemingly trifle details, can reveal about uh, the production of knowledge. Um, so one of my main areas of research is early modern uh, natural history. Uh, here uh, is a glimpse of the papers of the German philosopher Joachim Jungius, 
who taught in Hamburg in the first half of the 17th century. Mainly known for his work in mathematics uh, and logic and his influence on Leibniz, another German uh, ph uh, philosopher, Jungius also had interest in more mundane subjects. On the slide uh, is his collection of notes on botany. Um, at the top from right is only one of 12 volume of volumes of botanical notes each containing numerous small folders full of scrap papers with notes from reading, correspondence, and own observations. Uh, and below, you have an attempt by Jungius to provide a systematic index of, the collect of his collection of notes. And so what you can see here is how the beginnings uh, of what the retrospect looks like taxonomic botany really lay in drawing up registers and indexes for collections. Uh, and these often turn, uh, once works are published, uh, actually into the list of contents uh, of the works published. Another scientist I've uh, investigated quite intensely, this time with uh, support from the Wellcome Trust, uh, is the work by the uh, uh, Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus uh, in the 18th century. Uh, Carl Linnaeus is uh, well known to this day uh, because he shaped the way in which we uh, still name and classify uh, organisms. And in contrast to his 17th century predecessors, Linnaeus did not try to bring his collection of notes and botanical specimens into a fixed uh, topical order. He preferred uh, flexible paper tools, beginning with a loose sheet herbarium, so he kept uh, his herbarium specimens on loose sheets of papers that he could shuffle around. Um, and uh, ending at the end of his career uh, with uh, little paper slips that he kept and worked with uh, like modern index cards. So uh, one can say with a little bit of overstatement that he invented uh, the index uh, card. Um, Linnaeus conceived of names as mere labels and of classes, orders, genera, and species as boxes or containers for information. Um, and uh, that allowed him to cross-reference specimens, letters he received from foreign correspondents, um, uh, notes and publications in a way that allowed him to constantly update uh, his uh, work in botany. Um, okay, so let's fast forward to genetics um, in the um, uh, end of the 19th century and 20th, uh, early 20th century, closer to Edward's work. Um, here I have been particularly interested in the intersections of genetic and statistical reasoning. Um, a set of papers um, I have drawn from is that of the American anthropologist Franz Boas. He's well known for his critique of the race concept and of racial anthropology as it was uh, known back then. Um, and this critique was based on um, large scale anthropometric uh, campaigns involving measurements of physical traits of tens of thousands of individuals uh, in uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, I have studied uh, data sheets from these campaigns relating to a tribe resettled to the Indian territories in Oklahoma, uh, the Chick Chickasaw. And in contrast to the 17th and 18th century material that we've seen, we see that data collection is now uh, highly standardized. Boas used forms that were inspired by census taking. Um, uh, censuses were uh, beginning to be taken um, systematically. Uh, and in addition to physical measurements, uh, these data sheets contain information on age, gender, and ancestry of the measured person. And this allowed uh, Boas to analyze his data very flexible, compare the distribution of traits in differently defined uh, populations, and showing uh, a la large number of, um, uh, of, of results that in, in, in effect uh, undermine the very typological essentialist notions that people at the time had uh, about race. What this material also reveals are the social interactions between people involved in the, in the study. Boas is the one on the data sheets who calculates, so this is his handwriting, 
Um, he employed field assistants to do the actual measurements. And uh, one can show from um, the entries um, that the information on ancestry was actually coming from the study subjects. So one uh, can also uh, learn something about from this uh, about the uh, subjects of this uh, study. A final example, um, uh, the advent of Mendelian genetics or classical genetics, as we sometimes call it, in the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, this, is, this was intimately connected with the emergence of new ways of representing diversity. Um, for example, the Punnett square, you see an example here uh, on this document, developed by Galton and Punnett in uh, Cambridge. Um, which shows uh, possible combinations of genetic factors or alleles in the zygote, as well as their uh, probabilities. Um, in a study of readers' annotations in early genetic texts, including Mendel's own, Gregor Mendel's own famous paper on heredity in peas, um, I have shown uh, how the Punnett square emerged from readers' attempts to reproduce the combinatorial logic underlying Mendelian genetics. So here you have Wilhelm Johansen again, the guy who invented um, the term gene, um, sort of trying to understand by making his own markings in the text of Mendel's paper, um, how the combinatorics uh, work. And um, here is an early attempt of doing something akin to a Punnett square in a Swedish uh, geneticist's um, copy of Mendel's paper. Okay, so I would like to end here with a couple of conclusions. Uh, scientists' archives ideally um, include uh, all written material they worked with, i.e. not only net letters and notes, but also raw data, forms, newspaper clippings, off-prints, personal libraries, bills, accounts, etc. Uh, and such complete archives can allow us to grasp uh, um, how um, uh, the, the scientists uh, actually worked on a data uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, to grasp the paper machinery that they were uh, using, uh, uh, not only to store information and keep a kind of memory of what they were doing, but also to generate actually uh, new insights. And it also, such complete archives also allow to bring to the fore the collective nature of scientific work, the participation of colleagues, assistants, and journalists, uh, but also importantly, uh, patients and study subjects in the generation uh, of knowledge. Now this, uh, on the other hand, raises really fundamental challenges with regard to storage, preservation, and cataloging of archives. And um, I guess that's something we can pick up in the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Hey, Stefan, thank you very much. It certainly does raise fundamental challenges, not least in this digital age. Um, but I suppose the the motto um, that the archive must cling to is um, that line, that stamp, keep in the right order, which you showed um, right, right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll move straight on to um, Dr. K. Elder. Thank you very much, Alan. I'll just share my screen. As Alan has pointed out, I started working at Bourne Hall in 1984. And at that time I was on the, the medical side. I had the tremendous honor and privilege of working quite closely with Patrick Steptoe uh, in consultations on the ward as a junior doctor and also assisting him in theater. So I started with the huge advantage when uh, the uh, the notes and papers started arriving up from, uh, from Duck End Farm. I think it was Jenny who first started bringing things up to my office in Bourne Hall. I was, um, I was tremendously excited. Uh, because I had always been immensely curious. I um, I worked as a, as a clinician first for a few years. And when I started working in the IVF lab, 
I um, I made a made myself a real nuisance because I had already had a substantial background in tissue culture. I had done tissue culture in many different ways in Scotland, in Colorado, and also in London. And I kept asking the uh, the people in the lab, the embryologists, why do you do it that way? Why do you do it that way? What happens if you do it this way? And of course, no one could give me any answers. So when all this material started came coming up, I um, I was really excited. I thought it was I found the equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the first thing that arrived was a big cardboard box with 479 loose sheets of paper. And I recognized that these were continuation sheets that had been taken out of patient clinical records. They also included scraps of paper, uh, the back of envelopes. There was, uh, there was some notes written on a paper towel. Um, they weren't in any particular order, as you can see from this, uh, this, this sample here. Uh, they weren't in any uh, chronological or any other kind of order. So I, I uh, sat down the floor in my office and spread all these papers around. First of all, see if I could find some kind of order. They didn't all have dates on them. Some of them had a patient's name. Some of them didn't have a name. Some of them had a date of birth. Um, so it was just a, a sort of scrambled jumble. But um, I did what I could to try and, and sort them either by, uh, by number or by date or by a particular patient. As you can see here, um, there were notes that had been obviously scribbled on later. Now, when, uh, when Patrick did laparoscopies in theater, uh, normally it was the anesthetist who wrote down what, uh, what Patrick was, dis was dictating. And this I think is what you can see here in blue. But then the, the, the scribbles in red uh, were obviously added later on, some of them in Bob's writing and some of them in Jean's handwriting. So uh, this, as I said, was the first thing that arrived. And then just another example of, of what I, I had to, uh, to start working with. Fortunately, I was familiar with the, with the handwriting of, of all of, uh, I recognized Bob's handwriting and Jean's handwriting. There were very few notes in Patrick's writing, but I, obviously it was, I knew exactly when uh, his notes were added. And then a series of hardback notebooks, which I've already been referred to, started to come up. They came up a few at a time. They didn't come up in any particular order. But over a period of three or four months, uh, we had accumulated a collection of notebooks. They were different types of notebooks, L for laparoscopy, H for hormone, F for follicular fluid, T, D for tables and data, and F for freezing. Um, eventually, I, uh, I was able to sort them into different types of data. So the L, the laparoscopy books, fortunately were, were obviously started by Jean and they were all in numerical and chronological order, starting with L naught and going up to L nine from January, 1969 to July, 1978. They didn't start at L one, they started at L 134. So I presume they had already done uh, 133 laparoscopies that were recorded somewhere else before these genes started these particular notebooks. The H books, there were eight of them starting from November 1969. Um, the H numbers were not the same as the L numbers. So one patient could have three or four different H numbers at different times. In fact, I couldn't make head or tail of what these H data was about and I decided to just leave it. I didn't, uh, I didn't know where to begin on how to, how to, or how to tackle it. Um, the, the first four books went up to July 1976. Um, eventually I realized when I went back that there was about two years of data that didn't seem to correspond to any of the laparoscopy data. There was no H5 or H6. I thought they had disappeared or gone missing, but then eventually 
I realized that um, they, at some time in, during 1976, they decided to change the H numbers so that they corresponded with the L numbers. And that made it much easier to keep track of the patients and their, their hormone levels, H was for hormones. Uh, Follicular Fluid was just one book going from 1969 to 77. And um, they summarized follicular fluids that were collected and um, also any um, assays that were done on culture bloods or the way that the culture blood was treated. The culture blood was, was used to uh, supplement the, the tissue culture medium. There was some detail about stimulation or laparoscopy and uh, assays on serum granulosa cells, um, assays for different types of hormones. Uh, the TD book didn't have any dates or names, and this was almost entirely in Jean's handwriting. It was data that had uh, been collated according to the type of stimulation that the patients had. There was a summary of all the natural cycles, a list of embryo transfers, a list of natural cycles, and an overview of some of the laparoscopy numbers. I am... Um, I, I was really intrigued to see what on earth I could find in all of this. And I started entering every bit of information that I could find into an Excel sheet. Start, I started with the, uh, with the box of notes. So this is the, the notes. And I entered whatever I could find, the stimulation, the date. Uh, and as I started looking in, at different sources, if I started looking at the old books, I could, um, um, I started adding more columns according to the information that, that I found there. And um, so the, the follicular fluid book didn't start until September. So every single bit of information that I could decipher, I entered into an Excel sheet. And I kept adding columns according to, uh, to what I could find. So by 1976, different types of uh, comments were being added, different types of medium. 1978, uh, histology, luteal support, um, other types of experiments, etc. So it was really like trying to put together a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Um, that's, that was really the way that I looked at it. I kept finding pieces here, there, and in different places, in different books. I would find one date that corresponded in the follicular fluid book. I'd find one, one name that corresponded with something that didn't have a date, and I managed to put them together somehow. So it was literally like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And eventually, uh, with Martin Johnson's help, we managed to deduce all of the different technical challenges that they were undertaking at the time. So absolutely everything that we take for granted now as part of a routine IVF cycle, they were working out from scratch, from technical aspects, um, everything, types, different types of stimulation, how and when the cycle should be monitored, um, different, uh, pages and pages about culture media and culture system changing the gas. There were periods when things worked and when things didn't work. And um, it was obvious that they went back and, and started troubleshooting, comparing Cambridge water with Oldham water, uh, using different timings. Um, well, it was really an, an extraordinary piece of work. And I realized that each individual challenge really required so much patience and perseverance and ingenuity. And of course, all on a background of fundamental basic background knowledge that, that Bob and Patrick and Jean had gained for all of the years before they started this work. An extraordinary piece of work. And it also required a lot of patience and perseverance from the patients, of course. I put together a time scale of events that I felt were um, 
fundamental parts of the jigsaw puzzle, things, things that, uh, that, that allowed them to move from one challenge on to the next one. And uh, the number of cases that they did before they went on to the next one, they, uh, they found excellent embryos uh, after 64 laparoscopies. Um, they didn't do the first embryo transfer until they had done 169 laparoscopies. And then they started changing the uh, monitoring, luteal support, um, just all the, everything that had to be uh, tackled and resolved before they moved on to the next challenge. Now, this is an overview of the data that we found. A total of uh, 520 procedures, but not all of them went to laparoscopy. Um, their their uh, success at recovering eggs was actually very high very quickly. 92%, 95% of the laparoscopies um, eggs were found and 39% uh, wound up with embryos. They did 112 embryo transfer procedures. And um, as we all know, uh, the end result was uh, two live births. Louise Brown, who was born in 1978, and Alistair MacDonald, who was the result of IVF treatment in Oldham during May 1977. There was also a further two um, sad pregnancies, one neonatal death and one miscarriage in 1978. And I love this photo. I think it just, can you imagine the elation after all of that work? They'd both been working towards this for at least 20 years. Uh, they'd been collaborating together for just over 10 years. And uh, you can just see the, the expression of their faces. I think that's a wonderful photo. So um, I was really, really grateful to have the opportunity of looking at this data. Um, I was fascinated, I was absolutely fascinated and to, to try to uh, follow and work out um, the way that they were thinking, the things that they were trying to do and how they were trying to troubleshoot and attack each challenge head on. Um, in the end, they, uh, by 1977, they had actually gone right back to square one and decided that perhaps one of the reasons for their failure was because of the, the manipulations and the drugs that they were given. And uh, they went right back to natural cycles and uh, trying to recover just one perfectly ripe egg at exactly the right time. And that was what led to the eventual success. So I will leave it there. Um, everything that we found has been published in great deal in, in a series of six papers. Um, the materials and methods, the treatment cycles and their outcomes, the, the variations in the procedures. And then Martin tackled the ethical aspects. We re-examined the role of Jean Purdy and uh, another really fascinating uh, aspect to all of this is the sources of support and uh, how they managed to get it all done. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, Stefan. It's wonderful to hear about the incredible amount of sort of detective work and, and, and patience that, that, that has gone into um, both your, your research. Um, I just wondered, and I suppose this is an archivist's question, um, and you, you were dealing very much with paper records. Um, how do you see the challenge of dealing with sort of electronic data sets in the future? How, how easy would it have been to do this um, if the material had, had all been electronic? Would it have been easier? Would it have been harder? Um, Kay, do you want to, to come in on that one first? Oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's something that I, I have a a huge interest in and a lot of experience in because my my son is a, a technology genius. I was uh, very, very fortunate. He, he placed the technology in front of me and made it easy for me. 
So I started using electronic data uh, long, actually I, I had email and internet access before we had it at Bourne Hall, I had it at home, thanks to my son who was only 11 or 12 at the time. But um, I have definitely noticed over the years that different people have different attitudes and discipline to keeping electronic records. Um, I, as I said, I was very, very lucky that Robbie taught me when, when, uh, when I first started using a computer in, the, in 19, must have been 86, 85, 86, we got our first computer. And um, dealing with a lot of other people who came to it much later and perhaps later in life, it, it requires a whole new discipline a whole new attitude. I mean, I'm sure the younger generation are quite good at much better than our gen, my generation. <laughs> but um, it really depends on having someone who knows how to organize their data digitally and electronically. Um, it can be overwhelming. It can have, as I'm sure you you know, it can be overwhelming, especially with so much available online nowadays. Um, I'm sure uh, Roger has a lot of experience with this as well, with all his research and his vast amount of uh, writing and publication. And um, Stefan, did you want to come in at all? Um, yeah, I, I, it, it of course depends on what one is looking for in archives. Um, um, there are, I, I talked about archives as machineries um, that were already constructed by those who produced them. And some aspects of that, uh, some material aspects and the three-dimensional workings of, 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 a, of an archive are very difficult to reproduce uh, digitally. Um, it, 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 it's of course always somehow possible, but it is very difficult. And it, it also- you, you, have to, them... you have to approach it. You have to approach it knowing what you want to do. And exactly, not, yes. Not, not many people do that. Yeah. Retrospectively, not not many people have started off doing that. Yeah. So so when I work, I mean, all the material by Linnaeus is uh, available uh, online now. Uh, the Linnaean Society has done a wonderful job with their collections. Um, but navigating that, um, you you actually um, um, have a big advantage if you've worked with the physical archive. Uh, first of that, uh, first of all, and um, then it's easy to use the digital, um, but yeah. um, uh, for certain purposes. Yeah, because you can understand the interrelationships between exactly. the, the, the different yeah. series and classes. And yeah. yes, okay. I, I would rather far rather look at hard copies if I'm trying to study something. Of course, the challenge will be going forward that it it, it won't exist in hard copy. That the things will be created digitally. Yeah. Um, got an, another, I'm conscious of the time. We've got an, another question that, that's come in for UK. This is from Lucy Van Der Beel. Um, and she says, thank you for a beautiful talk, Kay. You mentioned the return to the natural stimulation in the Edwards work. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the development of herbarian stimulation after the birth of Louise Brown, perhaps in relation to Edwards and your own considerations. Oh, after the birth of Louise Brown, well, they, they, they were, only able to start doing natural cycles because an assay became available to track the LH surge. They could pinpoint the LH surge and then uh, be able to time the laparoscopy uh, to coincide with the release of the mature egg. That was very, very important. They wouldn't have been able to do it without that. But uh, when they moved to Bourne Hall, they started doing, they repeated exactly the same formula. And it was two years later, although they, they had done no IVF whatsoever, their first cohort of patients was admitted with 23 patients. And uh, out of those, two of them actually became pregnant. And this was really uh, before any other IVF baby in the world had been born. There, were, there was uh, one or two on the way, but none, no more had been born. So they were immediately uh, successful with uh, the natural cycles in September 1980. But by that time, uh, uh, particularly the team in Australia and in other parts of the world uh, were using different types of stimulation. 
and um, Georgiana Jones, who's a fantastic endocrinologist, endocrinologist, did a lot of work looking at different types of stimulation as well. The, the, the move to using stimulated cycles was really enabled, um, first of all, to recover more than one egg, to increase the chances of success. And secondly, to be able to regulate the, the timing of the laparoscopy so that it didn't have to be done precisely in, according to the peak of the LH, according to the LH surge, because it sometimes happened that the, uh, the operation had to be timed in the middle of the night and that's when it was done. So the move away from that, um, it started, we, was, we started to use stimulated cycles by January, 1981 introducing clomiphene first and then clomiphene HMG. But it was really based on a lot of work that uh, was being uh, carried out both in Australia and by other teams throughout the world. I'm sure you must have come across the, um, the proceedings of the first IVF meeting that was held in September, 1981 at Bornholm. And that, uh, that's a fascinating <laughs> book. It, um, I still refer to it from time to time, although it was, it was published in 1981. It was published in 1982. Bob and Jean edited all the proceedings of all the presentations that were given at that meeting. And there's a lot of data about um, moving, comparing the natural cycle and moving to stimulate cycles and different types of stimulation, different types of monitoring, etc. Thank you very much. Um, one of the problems with this symposium is um, time. Um, I mean, clearly there, there are other questions um, and I will try and come back to, to, to some of those at the end. And I hope that we can regard today's events as a sort of starting point that will lead into um, further debate and discussion on these issues. But for the moment, um, thank you, Kay. Thank you, Stefan. Um, um, we must move to our, our next couple of speakers. Um, so far, we've been looking at sort of the archival outcomes of, of, of Bob's work, um, and, but we have, I think, particularly in this last session, also touched on the, the processes that led to their creation, the way in which Bob and his team worked. Um, and to discuss this further, um, I'm delighted to call upon um, two people who were very much part of the team. Um, professor Sir Richard Gardner, Emeritus Royal Society Research Professor at the University of Oxford, and Professor Roger Gosden, lately professor at Cornell University, now visiting scholar at William Mary, an official biographer of Robert Edwards. Roger's book, Let There Be Life, an intimate portrait of Robert Edwards and his IVF revolution is now available for, for, for purchase online. And we put a link in the Zoom chat um, for those who want to know more about um, some of the themes that we're um, exploring today. Um, but both what Richard and Roger are now going to do is to explore in a bit more depth Robert Edwards' style of working in the laboratory and what it can tell us. And I think we're going to start with Sir Richard. Thank you very much. <coughs> I um, want to uh, cover the period really from 1966 to 73, which was the my period of time in in. Um, Sorry if I got something wrong here. <clears throat> it, it is the period where I worked uh, with Bob. Uh, the <clears throat> meeting with Bob began in <clears throat> 1966, in the spring of 1966. Both Martin Johnson and I were doing part two physiology in the Cambridge trial, Tripos, and um, one of the courses on offer that seduced us away from the straight line of neurophysiology and biophysics was in reproductive physiology, largely given both in terms of lectures and practicals by Bob. Uh, the head of the lab at that time in the top of physiology, it was called the, the um, he was called the Marshall Professor. That was the Mary Marshall and Arthur Walton Professor of Reproductive Physiology. That was Sir Alan Parks, who'd been Bob's boss at the Experimental Biology Division at Mill Hill and had taken up the chair in Cambridge in 1960 and invited Bob to join him in 63. 
And we were immediately captivated by Bob's enthusiasm, the breadth of his knowledge, and the fact that he was really extraordinarily egalitarian. So here were these two naive undergraduates, but he showed us one of his, uh, his very precious human oocytes and very much conversed with us in practicals as if we were intellectual equals, which clearly at that stage, we certainly weren't. Uh, <clears throat> and luckily, I don't think this would ever happen nowadays, but Bob had never had any previous research students. We both said we wished to join him as research students. And um, both of us were appointed in the same year. It's unusual for funding bodies like the Medical Research Council to make two appointments, particularly to a supervisor who had no previous experience of supervising PhD students. But anyhow, we both started in the Marshall Lab at the top of physiology in the autumn of 1966. And Bob's style of uh, supervision was quite interesting. He would say right at the start, um, go away and do some reading for about three months to try and come up with some idea as to what you might like to do and to vary the reading by doing some practical, basic practical work, tissue culture, embryo transfer, et cetera, that would be necessary almost regardless of what you do. So the idea was to go away and read, come back in about three months time and talk to Bob uh, to suggest a project. And he would then discuss its feasibility and its ability to generate sufficient original data of interest for a PhD. And this was quite unusual at the time. The, the general pattern of supervisors, certainly in our field, was the supervisor would have the names of the four or five topics up, up his or her sleeve. Uh, these were questions they wished to have answers to, but didn't want to dirty their own hands with it. So they would uh, invite the students to pick one of these three, four or five topics. But no, with Bob, it was he was very much dedicated to the notion that if what you propose to do is part of your self, as it were, you'll get through the, the dark periods when things aren't working much more effectively than if you're just told to do this, go away and do this or that or the other. So I came up with, with Bob's help with a project which was to produce mouse chimeras, but not by aggregating cleaving embryos as had been done before, but to inject cells directly into the blastocyst. And because of its wealth of genetics and its short generation time, I opted for the mouse, um, <coughs> which was meant you were dealing with a structure that was about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter and required a lot of effort to get it technically up and going. <coughs> This was a hiatus period for Bob so far as IVF was concerned. Between 66 and 68, he was failing to achieve fertilization in vitro in the human and was thinking that work that was carried out in the 1950s by Chang and Austin suggested that sperm weren't immediately able to penetrate the egg. They had to undergo this ill-defined process called capacitation. And so he was trying all sorts of tricks, including putting sperm in millipore chambers, inserting them into the uterus for 12 or 24 hours. None of these things worked, but Bob ever, ever active and mentally and physically energetic decided not to waste his time. So he embarked on two projects. One was to look at the possible uh, possibility that oocytes were produced in a, a production line system that the earliest ones to enter meiosis in the fetal female were the first that had a higher number of crossing over or chiasmata and the first to be ovulated because he was obsessed with explaining the idea that many uh, <coughs> malformations owed their origin to malformation events in chromosome separation during oogenesis. The other, and he worked with this with someone called Alan Henderson. But the other project that he became interested in was the possibility of undertaking pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. He, he, he felt very sorely that uh, people who, couples who were 
likely to inherit a child with very serious genetic disease at present at that time, the only option was amniocentesis and abortion. And that for people who found that totally abhorrent, he, he thought up the alternative idea, if you could actually determine the genetics at an earlier stage prior to implantation, this would be more acceptable to people who felt very uncomfortable about aborting a developing fetus. So Bob invited me to join him in this, and we chose the rabbit blastocyst because we could, uh, there were ways that we could sex this reliably, which wasn't possible in the mouse, and the rabbit blastocyst was 50 times the diameter of the mouse blastocyst, although it proved an utter pain to work with. But we did eventually manage to biopsy these structures, uh, ascertain their sex, and then transfer them. And on the first transfer attempt, because after operation you had to stop the blastocyst collapsing, it really had to be fully inflated within an intact membrane, much like a, an inner tube within a tar. And if either was not fully expanded, the, the embryos would simply, the blastocyst would simply be expelled through the vagina. So I had to work very hard both to biopsy them and get them to re-expand after. So for the first experiment, Bob said, well, you're doing the embryology, I'll do the embryo transfer. So with great ceremony, he anaesthetized the rabbit, opened it up, and I handed him my first successfully operated six embryos uh, in a dish. And then after a few moments, he turned around with a sickly grin on his face, and there were six little pearls down his lapel of his lab coat. The whole lot had been discharged, not into the uterus, but onto his lab coat. And Martin said, I, I just stormed out of the room without saying a further word. But we did eventually get it going very successfully. And um, what he was, we were both rather bothered about is it was interpreted not so much as a way of avoiding the birth of children with serious genetic disease, but a way of simply enabling people to choose the sex of their offspring. The one other thing I'd say about that period, Ed, Edwards being such a fantastic egalitarian, is that he always involved his research students uh, in conversation with distinguished visitors to the lab. So on one occasion, one of these very distinguished people happened to be, uh, at an un as an undergraduate, taught by the great em German embryologist Speyman. So we had direct views on what this embryologist who operated many years before, uh, how he actually worked and what he thought about. And on another occasion when Sidney Brenner and Francis Crick working at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology had decided that the classic age of molecular genetics was over and they were looking for other problems uh, they invited Bob to join them at lunch at the Fountain Pub and invited me along as well, which I thought was uh, extremely generous of him that, uh, to give me an opportunity to not necessarily converse with, but at least hear uh, some of the gems from the lips of these, these great uh, uh, molecular biologists. So that was really the, the last part of involvement during that period was seeing how Bob suffered as a result of the media and other scientists. And it really was a very distressing time then. And even in mainstream physiology laboratory, because Bob felt it was right that every stage in the advance of his work, he needed to inform and enlighten the public. He'd take every opportunity to do this in tabloid and broadsheet newspapers. And this led him other people to have the perception that here was a scientifically lightweight person who was just seeking publicity, uh, which nothing could be further from the truth, but it was something that, that helped to make life very difficult for him, uh, as did criticism from very senior scientists that wasn't entirely clear or fair. So I think that those are my observations of that time. Richard, thank you very much. And um, we will now go straight to Professor Goldstein.
although I knew Bob Edwards for 40 years, I didn't have much time with him at the bench. On my first day in 1970, he said he would often be away with a new colleague in the North, but not to worry. I soon heard about Patrick Steptoe, but I am glad I had light supervision, frowned on today, because freedom helped me grow into an independent researcher and I had his full attention when needed. It's hard to talk about your mentor, except in exalted terms. He was an enigma. I never met anyone like him, a workaholic who easily switched off to relax, a man with a single-minded goal, yet who talked persuasively about many topics, stubborn, yet open-minded, and in the end, unaffected when he became a celebrity. Bob grew up in a loving home in Manchester, but not privileged. He took after a strong-willed mother and family politics, which may explain why he wanted his career to be socially useful. I was amazed how he stayed cheerful despite many setbacks to research in those years and hostility from the professions and press. I think it owed to being grounded with a wonderful wife and family. For holidays, he took them to Broadrake Farmhouse in a bleak Yorkshire Dale. With a big grin, he told how he would help a farmer repair dry stone walls, make hay and dip sheep. Heavy physical work was therapeutic. This was the place where he evacuated from during the Manchester Blitz as a boy. Three years ago, I stayed with two of his daughters at Broadrake, where I realized his story really began there in the Yorkshire mists. The urban boy fell in love with farming, chose agriculture at university before switching to medical science. Everyone under pressure needs a kind of Broadrake. To have a great mentor is an immeasurable blessing and Bob had four in a row. After two boring years of agriculture at Bangor, he switched to zoology, where Rogers Bramble introduced him to reproductive biology and immunology. He found his field, but took a huge risk because without finishing agriculture, he couldn't graduate with honors for independent research. A lucky break sent him to Edinburgh for a diploma of animal genetics and stayed on for his PhD and postdoc. Conrad Waddington from Christ College in Cambridge was head of the Institute, a man described by the developmental biologist Jonathan Slack as the last Renaissance biologist. Of all his mentors, Wad was the only one he pointedly called my professor and wanted the experience he had in Edinburgh of freedom and stimulating debate for his own group one day. Probably there were raised eyebrows when he didn't start work until lunchtime, but it was because he worked in the mouse house all night, waiting for mice to ovulate at around 2 a.m. for harvesting eggs. Collaborating with his wife, Ruth, they found how to control the mouse Easter cycle with injections, allowing him to work more social hours. His supervisor feared an appetite for too many projects and collaborations would be disastrous, but he produced over 50 papers before leaving for a postdoc at Caltech. He called that year a waste because a lot of effort didn't produce papers. The time looked better spent with Gregory Pincus, who was developing the pill in Massachusetts than with Albert Tyler, the California expert on sea urchin fertilization but the change of scene and intellectual ferment were stimulating. Albert had an interdisciplinary interest in reproduction and immunology and collaborated with his brother, Edward, a gynecologist at UCLA in an international network for contraception research. That rare example of doctor scientist collaboration was exactly what Bob needed for migrating to clinical science a few years later. Back in London, he joined the leading British reproductive physiologist, Sir Alan Parks. 
following him to the Marshall Lab in Cambridge. People are surprised to know the star scientist didn't become a full professor until 1985 at age 59, but he got along brilliantly with Bunny Austin, who was appointed over his head when Parks retired from the chair. Promotion was not his top priority. Bob was skillful in the lab, liked to entertain students pulling pipettes through a flame to an exact diameter. Evidently, he handled human embryos with immense care and went to extraordinary lengths to avoid contamination of the cell culture environment. My wife, Lucinda Vick, remembers his visits to her lab in Virginia soon after America's first IVF baby was conceived here. He wiped his finger along the top of a high cupboard to show her, then gave a big cheesy grin, though there wasn't a speck of dust on it, or so she said. He was a teaser and making a point. To be an excellent clinical embryologist, you must be obsessively careful. But I don't think he was quite so painstaking at recording data, not at least until Jean Purdy kept records in the famous Oldham notebooks. From the 1950s, he jotted data in A5 hardback and exercise books and on loose papers, none of them very durable media. Contrast that with my postdoc supervisor, Jack Everett in North Carolina. His shelves had an orderly series of expensive cloth bound journals recording experiments in meticulous detail back to the 1940s. Copper plate writing in pencil, more permanent than ink. An archivist's dream. Bob never regarded data or theories too precious to be cast off as science rolls forward. He had the same attitude as an editor of journals, loving novelty and enjoyed beating up tired theories. Sometimes he ignored reviewers if they sent a damning report about a paper he liked, or wanted to give authors the benefit of the doubt, especially if young. He was a more intuitive scientist than the methodical Anne McLaren, who paid a big compliment one day when she whispered to me at his lecture that out of a hundred short-lived ideas, he had one that sparkled far ahead of its time. The Marshall Lab was a crowded outpost at the top of the physiology block. I remember an American visitor asking how it could be so successful without better equipment and a bigger team. Bob fired back, it was better to be rich in ideas, but there was more to it than that. Always keen on sport, he set an example of good sportsmanship in academic life, loyalty and trustworthiness, cooperation and confidence to ask questions. Our team captain relished debate and hard to beat, even when he played devil's advocate, making you thankful you weren't in the opposing team on which he could pour sour comments. It was the happiest workplace I ever knew and fun to go to work. You had respect, no matter if you were a junior student, technician or secretary. Egalitarianism had deep roots in his anima and was generally shared. As a naive student, I thought every lab was the same. As another graduate student, Barry Babister said how Bob granted him authorship of key IVF papers, a generosity that exceeded convention. He promoted his protégés and lavished praise on Patrick and Jean and after her death, fought to have her name on a plaque in Oldham. Soon after it opened, Bourne Hall offered IVF training and hosted conferences for freely exchanging news and methods. Alas, some visitors became competitors and the early spirit of cooperation didn't survive commercialization of fertility medicine. I often saw him in later years at foreign conferences where young doctors and researchers swarmed around him, easy to see in the crowd in his signature white jacket. He was too much a fighter to be called an angel, but since his shining light has gone out, 
the lives of those who knew him are duller. Okay, thank you so much, Roger. Um, well, um, in a short period, we've moved from looking at the archive to some of the scientific processes and research that created, and, uh, did, created it and underpinned it, um, now towards moving towards looking at the, the personality that, that, that drove that research. Um, and for a real insight into the man behind the myth, um, we are now going to go to um, someone who knew him extremely well. Um, Jenny Joy is one of Bob's five daughters. After obtaining a degree and doctorate in zoology, Jenny's working life has been focused on wildlife and conservation. But she has also helped her father with his writing um, by working, I think, at least two short spells at Bourne Hall, and perhaps more importantly for today, by performing the vital task of sorting his papers after his death, which must have been a very difficult task as well. The Archive Centre and Churchill College owe her a huge debt. And we're going to hear now a, a, a short recording from Jenny, and then um, we will have some discussion and questions with all our speakers afterwards. Good afternoon. Dad was the same person within the family as he was at work. Enthusiastic, driven, ambitious, and keen to get heavily involved in things he was passionate about. There is no doubt, as others have mentioned, that his early life in Manchester, followed by his time in the Yorkshire Dales and his army experiences in Palestine, shaped his thoughts, ideas and views, and he would come back to these again and again throughout his life. These photos provide a snapshot of Dad's early adult life. Before enlisting in the army and being posted to Palestine, shown in the photo on the left, he was sent to live at Broadwake Farm in the Yorkshire Dales during the early part of the war. The two other factors that shaped him were the place of his birth and his immediate family. He was a Yorkshireman, having been born in Batley and very proud of it too. The quote in Roger Gosden's book, Let There Be Life, that you can always tell a Yorkshireman, but you can't tell him much, is so very apt for my father throughout his life, who always thought he was right in any argument. He also, as Roger's book says, could talk the hind legs off a donkey on almost any subject from an early age and that ability stayed with him until the very end of his active life. His mother was a very capable woman with firm ideas, and he was one of three strong-minded boys. This photo, to my knowledge, is one of few that exist of my dad with his two brothers all together. They were all very similar in looks, voice, mannerisms and character, but they all took very different career paths. Being able to win long-fought battles at home no doubt helped my father to keep going during the long battles ahead in his work. His working life began when he started studying genetics at Edinburgh, where he found a subject which ignited his passion. Very quickly, he was spending night after night in the mouse house and this engaged him in following all sorts of academic ideas which were beyond his actual remit. Edinburgh University was also the place where he met my mother. While they collaborated on research, as they were both studying genetics, the differences in their characters immediately started to become apparent. My mother always did the minimum required to obtain good results and devoted more of her energy to having a good social life and pursuing her many hobbies and passions. She always said you only had to look at the difference in the size of their PhD thesis to know who worked harder. It was telling that when they got married, my mother insisted they spend their savings on a honeymoon in Venice, which they did. These photos show my parents on their honeymoon in Venice and in California, where my father worked at Caltech, 
shortly after they were married. My mother again ensured they took plenty of holidays during their spell in the United States, and that emphasis on holidays was also a feature of our early family life. From the mid-1960s, we lived in Goffway in Cambridge. Goffway, a newly built cul-de-sac in Newnham, was perfect for family life, with neighbours we got to know well and a street playground where we used to go to meet our friends from an early age. With five girls born by 1965, my mother no longer had time to do any academic work, at least not until the youngest went to school. But she supported all of us as much as she could. We took part in lots of activities and frequently went out to places such as the Gog Magog Hills and Byron's Pool near Grantchester for family days out. And the picture you can see on the bottom right is of my mother and the five of us out on the gogs. My first real memory of my father's work impacting on our lives is when my mother spent evening after evening waiting for him to appear at the Silver Street traffic lights after a full day working in his lab in the physiology department. Back then, my parents shared a car, a Volkswagen minibus. Looking back, it was amazing that she did this, considering that she often had to have all five of us waiting in the car with her. She eventually graduated from that to driving into the Downing site to find somewhere to park. And that was an issue even in the 1960s. This slide shows the Downing Street site and our Volkswagen minibus. And a great photo of my father teaching. So back to waiting in the car. In the, in the event that Dad did a no-show, which was a frequent event, my mum would send one or two of us up the several flights of stairs to drag him out. But even that sometimes took ages to be successful. My sister Sarah remembers him showing us his caged mice to distract us from the ongoing wait. I very well remember his office and lab in physiology, so no doubt I was one of the ones sent in frequently. We would often end up talking to the students and staff while we waited for him to finish. So Dad's team, a photo of them on one occasion in 1983 to 1984, really became part of our family. He frequently invited his work colleagues home for drinks, dinners and parties and he continued to do this throughout his life. There was nothing he liked more than having people around him who could talk and debate about wide-ranging subjects, including politics. He hated small talk, greatly preferring to debate about serious topics. So having dinner guests to the house was a welcome respite for my mum and us five sisters. I also remember the chaos at home with piles of papers everywhere, particularly in his study and often all over the dining room table, which we were not allowed to touch. The piles of papers looked like they had seen better days as numerous sheets were cut and pasted and scribbled all over. I was therefore delighted to find comments from Dad's secretary, Barbara Rankin, which supported my memories. Two of Barbara's comments are shown on the next slide. In case you can't read them, they say on the left, Note real acellotape on desk for cutting and sticking. RGE's favourite method of altering manuscripts. His skill was considerable. On the right, it says, He had three trays behind his elbow, which I marked, urgent, pending and research in reproduction. He was editor of this monthly production. In his office, according to Barbara, he never allowed the windows to be opened in case the wind blew in and ruined his filing system. The photo at the bottom was taken of him at his desk, to which Barbara remarked, We had just had a clear out when this photo was taken and the desk is abnormally tidy. My sister Caroline remembers that he would often be very restless over the weekends impatient for Monday to arrive so he could carry on working. He did things at a hundred miles an hour and neither his family nor his colleagues could keep up with him. 
The first time I realised that my father's work was attracting attention was when we found a Japanese television crew hiding in our flower beds at Gough Way. The phone at home was always ringing. It was always for him, and although he rarely answered it, he used to shout at us if we inadvertently let a reporter through to him. But the press were cunning, and this did happen from time to time. Another aspect of his work at home were tapes for dictaphones left lying everywhere. A dictaphone went with him everywhere. He even took it to our holiday house, Brunsker, in the Yorkshire Dales, which he loved to escape to. Brunsker, shown on the left of this slide, was located right next to Broad Rake, the farm where my father was sent to live for a year by his parents during the early years of the war. This experience in the Dales had such an overwhelming impact on him that he continued to return to the Dales throughout his life. It is interesting that all of our family love the Yorkshire Dales in a similar way to our father, and we too visit whenever we can. Dad combined his pleasure at being there, where he helped local farmers with haymaking and dry stone walling, with working at the same time, keeping Barbara, his secretary, busy. The message on the right reads, Barbara, will you deal with these assorted items? Not much to hold you back. Can you send any spare tapes? I'm beginning to put pressure on now, and I would like to clear two or three chapters of the book. Clearly, the number of tapes he sent even wore Barbara down, particularly when she was helping to type his major book, Conception in the Human Female. So another note from Dad on the right is, Barbara, last tape, start new page, can we finish? Barbara put a picture of a broken glass to accompany this note to illustrate how she felt at the time. I also became involved with this book in terms of sorting out references as I was living at home at the time. And on the next slide is the sort of page we were faced with on a daily basis. How we all stayed sane being involved with this book, I do not know. Again, in the Rankin archive, Barbara states that she was paid 400 for typing this book over two years. When Caroline Blackwell joined the physiology team, they acquired an IBM golf ball typewriter, floppy disks and tipex. This reduced the need for sellotape and scissors, and floppy disks and tipex became the norm. This was both a blessing and a curse, as unfortunately Dad often lost or mislaid the tipex, and this would result in endless searches to find it and Dad getting very bad tempered. Of course, in general, the switch from typewriters to computers over the next 10 years meant that reprinting drafts was not nearly so onerous or difficult. Shortly after helping with this book, I joined the nursing team at Bourne Hall when it first opened in 1980. At Bourne Hall, I saw my father in a completely new role, in areas such as talking to patients, providing reassurance, working in the lab next to the theatre trying to find the follicles, and enjoying life buying antiques and helping to manage the grounds. From the time they opened the clinic to the end of his working life, my father enjoyed many aspects of Bourne Hall. He loved the success of it in terms of the number of babies, the teaching of the techniques to others, being at the forefront of ethical debates, the worldwide travel it led to, and in later years being a visitor and coming back to the wonderful celebrations of IVF milestones. I think maybe one of his biggest regrets was not being able to set up a profitable business there. In 1978, two years earlier, my family had moved to Duck End Farm, as shown in the next slide. My father had always wanted to get into farming, and this provided the ideal opportunity. The farm consisted of a very basic house which was two up, two down, some outbuildings and around 50 acres of land. While Dad was the initial driver to buy the farm, he soon decided that the cattle had replaced people in his life. So after a couple of years, he largely left the running of it to my mother. 
She continued with the cattle, but also developed a prize-winning flock of angora goats using embryo transfer techniques, and she took in DIY horse liveries. The farm, however, did provide Dad with very easy access to Churchill College, where he was a fellow from 1974. Given the opposition his work had received from many local quarters, he felt that Churchill had given him the respectability he needed, and he especially loved debating with the other fellows at dinner. He was therefore a frequent diner there over many years, especially for the fish lunch on a Friday. As the farm developed and they acquired more land, he loved other aspects of life there. They created a small lake. He planted lots of trees which he spent lots of times watering, and he loved maintaining his grasslands by tractor mowing. Planting trees and looking after the land gave him a break from his busy schedule, giving him time to think and to refresh his mind before returning to work again. He did also make a bit of time for some of his other passions, which included Wagner, Leeds United, England cricket and rugby, Morecambe and Wise and Steptoe and Son. With the development of the farmhouse and the setting up of RBM online at Duck End Farm, initially in a temporary office and then a converted barn as shown in the next slide, my father had everything he needed at home. I, like my other sisters, was amazed that he set up an online journal as his computing finesse did not seem to be that great and his own computer regularly needed fixing. However, setting up RBM online enabled him to take his own ideas forward and he very quickly had Caroline Blackwell and Fiona Bennett there who became part of the team and they could deal easily with any computing issues that might crop up. While papers for RBM online could in reality have been edited online by Dad, He stuck to his old method of using a pen in draft version of his papers. Like in the physiology department, he always encouraged visitors and colleagues to come across to the farm and he would show off the place he loved and was proud of. Despite receiving by then numerous awards and medals, he was always very approachable and he would talk to anybody about any subject just like he had in the early days. He was especially loyal to the people that worked for him and the patients and their children that had become very close to him. And the next slide shows my favourite picture, which is Dad together with Louise Brown and Alistair MacDonald. And he saw them whenever he could. Dad also hated wasting time after conferences and he always wanted to be somewhere else. I hate to think how much time over the years Caroline Blackwell spent organising and reorganising his travel schedule, always so he could get back to Duck End Farm as soon as he was ready. The sort of travel schedule you can see on the next slide was not unusual, and there is plenty of evidence for this in the Edwards archive. If he was near Canada, he would always make time to drop in and see his brother, Harry, and nephew Dean, even if he was several hundred miles away. Another of his skills to keep him going during the day was his ability to stop and snooze. On the way back from meetings, he would pull into a lay-by and sleep for 15 minutes, then wake up refreshed. I have never been able to do this. He kept this up even when he had an office at home and Caroline Blackwell well remembers him frequently disappearing for a nap. This kept him going for long hours despite often getting up very early in the mornings. We as a family could get the subject of salamanders and regeneration at breakfast, lunch and even after dinner when we were ready for bed. In the last years of his working life, He spent many hours burning various papers on a fire at Duck End Farm. This led us to believe that he had few personal papers left. So when Alan Packwood initially approached my mother about archiving my father's scientific papers, most of what Alan initially received were just scientific paper reprints in 2010 and 2011. In the six months following the death of both of our parents in late 2013 and early 2014, 
we unearth all sorts of his work-related papers in a number of surprising locations. Huge stacks in the back of his wardrobe, in the wool shop in the yard and in the dining room sideboard, as well as in his desk. As they were discovered, I collected them up and took them back to Shropshire to catalogue on a spreadsheet under various headings. Every pile needed careful sorting, as there were lots of personal items between the working sheets. Right to the end, my father's filing system was one only he could really understand. As everybody here now knows, the variety of the papers that he had secreted away was immense, and we now have a more detailed record of those challenging early years. I really like Joan Wintercorn's description of his archive in 2014, when she did the acceptance in lieu offer to the archive, which led to its deposit at the Churchill Archive Centre. What she said was, The archive of Sir Robert Edwards is of national and international importance. It records the pioneering work of Edwards and his colleagues in developing human in vitro fertilisation therapy, a milestone in the development of modern medicine. His work ushered in a new field of modern medicine. The archive also documents the numerous profound and often controversial consequences and implications of IVF and records the discussions and debates that have taken place since the first announcements were made. Scholarly interest in the Edwards Archive is already developing in Cambridge and the archive will be of outstanding importance to historians and researchers in many fields when it becomes generally available. So, having spent quite a number of months of my life putting my father's archive together, it is very great to be part of this conference today and to see his archive now being used in the way it should be. My last slide is a picture of RBM Online Office unloading equipment at Bourne Hall. Part of the legacy my father left, returning to a place he started. Dad would so approve of this, especially as the RBM online office is in the attics at Bourne Hall, the place that he spent many happy hours, where I saw him often and where I too have many happy memories. I would like to thank the Churchill Archive Centre for providing access to the Edwards and Rankin archives, to the family of Barbara Rankin, to Caroline Blackwell for sharing memories and helping with photos, and to Bourne Hall for allowing me to use their photograph of my father with Alistair and Louise. The Edwards family also very much appreciates the care and consideration that has been shown to them by Churchill College since our father's death in 2013. Thank you. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for that. I think his ability to nap proves that your father was a a true Churchillian and was associated with the right Cambridge College. Um, Also, very glad um, to know that that not all of the papers um, were burnt and incredibly grateful to you and your sisters um, for the role you played um, in saving the archive and and getting the archive um, to us. Um, So, Um, We do now have a a little bit of time for questions and discussions, and you can post your questions in the Zoom Q&A. I want to thank all our contributors from this afternoon for giving us a real sense of Bob Edwards and his ways of working. And perhaps we can get the discussion started by um, picking up on a question that was asked by Lucy in the um, chat earlier on. She asked um, whether um, we had found any stories about the processes, debates, and decisions involved in creating the world's first fertility clinic um, at Bourne Hall. Um, And I suppose if we go to to Roger, perhaps, first of all, in, in, in researching the biography, what did you find? Well, Bourne Hall, um, was not a place I worked. And so I think this question should really go to Kay, um, if she doesn't mind taking it. (laughs) Okay. 
a lot of my material came through Kay. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there is one specific box which is entirely dedicated to uh, considerations about Bourne Hall and the site and the application through planning commission and, and all of that. Um, Madeline, I'm sure you must have a copy of the, uh, the fantastic proposal. Um, I still have the original copy, but it was digitalized. And I think I gave you a photocopy or at least a printout of the digital edition. Whether yes, we've got the digital copy and I think we've got a printout as well. Yeah. So you know you know what I'm talking about, yes. Yeah. So so then that's an amazing document. It really is in such in immense detail about all the considerations, all they were thinking about, even down to daily menus for the patients because the patients had to have very special treatment. Um, yeah, no. So yes, there is, there is a box. I'm not sure if that went to you, Madeline. I know that last year, just before everything shut down, I was waiting for a visit from the Wellcome Trust. Who are going to take away everything else in my office um, and I don't know if the, if the Bourne Hall box is still there or whether it went to you but certainly there is there is a lot of discussion and letters and um, and details about the, the plans and the and the problems encountered in getting permission to do what they want to do. I wonder then if we might ask Jenny um, from the sort of family perspective, um, do you have any memories, particular memories or anecdotes from around that time when Bourne Hall was being created? Um, I do in terms of um, the problems of trying to find a place that could host a clinic for them. And Bourne Hall initially seemed a very unlikely location, given my father's Labour Party politics in this giant mansion that they ended up in. Um, I think um, it wasn't what my father thought of initially. Um, I think the porter cabins um, were uh, a very different way of setting up, but they had no option. Um, in, in the beginning and obviously they, when, the, when they did turn those into buildings it was too late because at that time the treatment had changed and it no longer required inpatient treatment so um, I think that's about it really I mean what other aspect were you thinking of Alan? Uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny if I could interrupt I'm, I'm sure you know the story which your dad used to tell repeatedly uh, about how it was Jean who, who found the place in the first place. She was sent out during that, that two year period when uh, he and with your help and Barbara and everybody else's help was uh, composing this fantastic masterpiece of <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have a copy. It's unbelievable how uh, yeah, it's incredible that people could be, do that without the, without the, the all the aids that we have nowadays. But anyway, during that two year period, Jean was sent out to trawl around estate agents. And uh, uh, Bob got a, a phone call from one of the estate agents saying that this, this, uh, this young woman has come in and says that, you're, that, that they're interested in, in buying Bourne Hall. They obviously thought it was, it couldn't possibly be true. Um, but uh, Jean fell in love with the place. I mean, she just, yeah. just, she just said, you know, this is it. And, and so did your dad, as you know. I mean, they, yeah. Yeah, he just loved the place, everything yeah. about it. He was so, <laughs> he's just so uh, the, the gardens and the furniture and everything about it. I mean, he was just yeah. he was passionate about it as he was with everything. Yeah, I, I think also you have to factor in that they'd yeah. only bought the farm in 1978. Yeah. So he was writing the book and um, getting the farm established with my mother yeah. and Bourne Hall. So that was a huge amount to be taking on all in one short period of time. And then the, they, they thought they had financial support from the, from the, the Daily Mail the newspaper uh, who allowed them to buy Bourne Hall. Yes, I do remember all of that as well. Yes, they, yes. They, they, uh, they drew out completely in April yes. They said, oh, no, this is too risky. We can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> Still didn't give up. Still didn't. <laughs> May I ask a question? I think it should be directed either to Kay or Madeline or both. Three years ago, 
um, some of you will know that um, a group of us um, tried to um, replace um, Jean Purdy's memorial in Grantchester churchyard with something that we thought was more fitting. And at, on that occasion, um, her brother came along, uh, John, whom it took me nearly two years to actually locate him. And we needed him to get permission to do this. At the reception afterwards at Bourne Hall, he showed me a scrapbook. Um, it had a red hardback cover and was the scrapbook that she had kept for many years, containing all sorts of cuttings and annotations and a few letters, and also a very poignant letter right at the very end about her dire diagnosis. He, he, he left it, he said he was leaving it. <laughs> he said he was leaving it at Bourne Hall. And um, I had a chance to look at it before the meeting closed, but I heard that it had disappeared. And I, I, have I, just want... I have it, I have it, Roger. You have it, oh good. I have okay. it hidden away. Hidden ah, away. right, okay. I'm very um, glad about that because I, it's, I, it's I quite a nice... I don't let precious record. things disappear. <laughs> Thank you. I have it hidden though. I don't know <laughs> what to do with it yet. Excellent. Well, we're very, well, I think we're all very pleased and, and relieved to, to, to know that. Um, just want to bring the conversation round now onto the sort of the future and the and and the use of, of the archive um, going forward. And we, we talked a little bit about that um, earlier on. But I know that we have um, on on this call Dr. Lara Marks um, and um, Lara, um, who's based at King's College London, has asked if she can spend just a couple of minutes um, introducing everyone to an important educational initiative that she's leading. Uh, and which we hope will utilize the archive and take some of its contents to, to a younger audience. So, so Lara, do you want to Hi, um, I hope everyone can see the screen that I've just put up, which um, just gives an overview of uh, the presentation I prepared just to get sense of what we're trying to do. Um, this is a collaboration between myself and St. Saviour's and St. Olaf's Secondary School in Southwark, which is in an area of disadvantage. And the project we're trying to do is to increase young people's understanding about the challenge of infertility by getting the young people to engage with the historical sources behind the British Revolution and assisted reproductive technology. And we really would like to use Edwards's archive as well as that of others who I'll come to in a minute. But what we're trying to do is get the students to work together on the material that's in the archive. So they'll help us select, digitize, and curate the historical materials for display. And we also want to get oral history interviews with some of the early IVF developers. And in fact, some of the speakers today, I would really welcome coming to chat to you and maybe getting you also to talk to the students and also the IVF beneficiaries. And we also have the idea that we'd like the students to start collecting stories with their extended families and local communities to capture the lived experiences of infertility and how that's changed with the arrival of IVF. Because there's been a lot of discussion today about the scientific work, but what we're also trying to do is capture the social history of the lives of those who it changed. And we also want to see how it's changed perceptions of infertility and we can, you know, overcome some of the challenges with that. Um, and the aim is that we'll get the students working with material in both the Edwards archive and, and other um, pioneers that I'll look at in a minute uh, to develop a panel exhibition for display both in schools and libraries and local clinics and to create a free permanent online exhibition which will be hosted on what is biotechnology which is a website I set up um, with MRC funding a few years back, which now gets 1.2 million page views a year. And one of the things I really liked about um, Joy's comment about um, the archives of um, Robert Edwards being of international and national importance is that really by doing this, we will really open it up, not just to the Cambridge community, but also nationally and internationally, framing it around the issue of infertility. And the sources we're looking to look at to work with are both Anne McLaren's papers, the Robert Edwards papers, and also go to the beneficiaries. So look at Leslie Brown's papers that have just opened up in the Bristol archives. 
So by doing this, we're hoping to really open up um, the challenges of infertility and get young people to understand infertility, which, you know, without the key work that Edwards and Steptoe did, as well as McLaren early on, would be a very different story. Um, and one of the reasons we want to get young people to work with this is that the earlier you know about the challenge of infertility, the more you can deal with it, that often, unfortunately, couples who are infertile have left it too late and there's not enough to do, you know, there's not much one can do at that point. So we want to educate the young people about that. Um, and just to give you an idea of um, the project um, timeline, it will take 21 months to complete. We've had some donations from the Anne McLaren Memorial Trust and we're going to the National Lottery Heritage Fund to get funding and any other donations that people can think of where we can go, we would really welcome. Um, and the project partners here I've just listed. Um, so St. Saviour's and St. Olaf School um, are a girls' comprehensive voluntary aided school in a very socially disadvantaged area. And one of the nice things also is that um, they've done a lot of work with Create Health Foundation, which was a UK charity dedicated to improving fertility education and run one of the first um, educational programs around infertility. So they're an ideal partner to be working with. And then the website, um, as I say, we set up in 2013 and it creates um, a really lovely channel to provide the information out there around the historical sources and get the public engaged um, with this information. So that's just an overview. I hope that people will engage with, please come back to me. I'd really welcome people's contributions, ideas, how we can get funding for this. It's really, um, it both makes use of the archive, but at the same time, we reach a younger audience, which often we don't reach with academic papers or books and get people excited about the history, get young people to engage with the historical material, but at the same time, get excited about the science. And, you know, hopefully we can touch on budding scientists and get them inspired. Lara, thank you very much. Um, it's an exciting project and one that the Archive Centre is delighted to um, support. Um, and um, if there are people on this call who would be interested in knowing more or be interested in um, speaking to Lara, um, then if you get in contact with us, we can put you in touch. Um, we do have um, a couple of questions that have come in and it would be nice to see if we can, if we can, if we can get through them in the time remaining. Um, so um, Sandy Starr asks, the 1969 to 78 figures that Kay Elder discussed earlier are so striking. At least 282 patients undergoing at least 520 procedures resulted in five pregnancies, which in turn resulted in two live births. We owe so much to the 280 plus people who didn't have the outcome they might have hoped for. Can anything be done to engage with them and their stories while respecting data protection? or must that wait until the 2050s? Um, also, are there meaningful points of comparison with other participants in other pioneering procedures, perhaps with related archives? So maybe if I go first to, to, to Madeline on, on, on this one, um, going forward, um, might we have plans, do you think, to engage um, with some of the, the unsung heroes and heroines of this story? That would be great, but I think we would have to ask them to come to us because we couldn't contact them through finding their names in the clinical research notebooks. That wouldn't really be ethical, but we could put a call out saying, if you are one of these women, please feel free to get in touch. Perhaps we could do some kind of oral history project with them. Um, not something that is in the pipeline now, but it's definitely something worth thinking about because they are a really significant contributor to the whole project um, and it would be great to do something about that and I don't really know about the second part of the um, the question about other projects which are which relate to this well in a sense I suppose this this touches on some of the work that you're doing does it Lara Sorry, it took me time to find the unmute. Yes, it definitely touches on that. And in fact, one of the things we're thinking of doing is advertising to get interviewees to come forward to be interviewed so we can work together. What we're interested in doing is getting some of the very early beneficiaries who had IVF and maybe those who maybe didn't, it didn't work for. So hopefully we can collaborate with you on that. 
um, and, and with also interested in how the development of the technology has shaped generations' expectations. So not just the early beneficiaries, but their daughters and sons, you know, how it's changed our whole understanding of infertility and what can be done about it. And we will be going out to networks and advertising. And talking of um, unsung heroines, um, we have a, a question from Peter Broad, um, and this is directed at Jenny. Um, and he asks, very little has been said about your mother and her background and her role in the Marshall Lab and your dad's research. Would you be prepared to enlighten the viewers about her role as she so often left out? Uh, well, thank you very much for bringing that up. I mean, um, uh, obviously in the early days, dad discussed everything with my mother and um, some of the letters in the archives show that that was very true. Um, I think when it, as soon as she had five children, then obviously for a few years her mind was elsewhere, but she did return back to the Marshall Lab quite quickly, um, as soon as the twins went to school. Um, I mean, she was a match for Dad in any argument, so, you know, they were very well suited. She was very bright, very focused. Without Mum, I don't think dad would have had the ability to do the research that she did um, because she could look after the whole family while he got on and did his work. Um, so she was a huge driving force. And, um, you know, they, they debated very much over the years. Mm. I think the fact that she did IVF um, transfer in her goats was really interesting as well. <clears throat> there can't be many goat herds at that time that were um, created by that method. So mm -hmm. I've actually got all her data in a file. So I'd like to um, maybe do a paper on that one day. Um, mm -hmm. So they were very different people, but, um, and had very different interests, but she was always there for him. And right up at the end, you know, some of the notes that he left for her were just, just lovely. You know, he realised how important coming back to the farm and the role that she had played in everything. And um, we as a family know what she did. And, um, but yes, it, it, you're quite right. You know, even in what I said, I didn't focus on my mother that much. And um, she is one of the key women in the story. Okay, thank you. So we're running out of time, sadly. Um, and I think perhaps the way to end this is just to go round um, to, to some of our speakers and um, those that, that knew Bob particularly well um, and ask them just very quickly to summarise what they, what they think it was that made him such a, a, a great scientist, such a great communicator, such, such a great person. Um, obviously, I mean, you touched on it in, in various presentations, but perhaps if you have sort of a particular last anecdote or, or, or some last thoughts, now, now would be the time. Um, and maybe, Sir Richard, if we start with you. Well, I think he's, he was just always in advance of his time and thinking ahead. I mean, it was <clears throat> 22 years after the <clears throat> proof of principle pre-implantation diagnosis that people had accepted it seriously. He, he wrote in, in 1984 uh, about using spare embryos as a source of stem cells for regenerative medicine. And it took another 12 to 14 years before anyone started to try and derive uh, stem cell lines from spare human embryos. He was just incredibly in advance of his time, really. Yeah, and Kay? Yeah, well, I agree completely with Richard. I mean, he, he was absolutely a visionary, but uh, what I remember is just his unbelievable enthusiasm and energy for everything. I mean, he really, I mean, he could wear anybody out and he could talk about any, he could talk about any subject under the sun to anybody. And I have many, many anecdotes of, of people in the field who have said to me, you know, he was sitting next to me at an airport, he engaged me in conversation about this, that, and the other, and I had no idea who he was. 
And he, he was just like that. I, oh, I could tell you a million anecdotes of trying to travel with the man. It was just really hard to keep up with him. But you know, what an inspiration. Absolutely, what an inspiration. And such integrity, really. That's, um, it sounds as though there's material there for a further oral history. Um, but um, uh, Roger, coming, coming to you. Well, so much has been said, but it's difficult not to repeat it. But to say something that hasn't just been said, I would say one of the qualities that was quite extraordinary was his fearlessness. He was very confident in what he knew, but he could move on. I don't remember him saying, I was wrong about this or that, but you knew that he could move on past things that he had worked on, spent long time on. He was able to get over disappointments and he was able to confront controversy in a way that I think was very courageous. And now we look back on those times and those people who weren't around at the time to observe it probably think, you know, this was just an inevitable um, evolution of medicine, science, but without his courage, we probably would have been waiting for IVF for a long time. So that's my impression. And Jenny, it seems fair to give you the, the last word on the <laughs> I, th I think, you know, I mean, obviously it's everything that everybody's already said, but he was driven, determined, enthusiastic about everything and not afraid to go into new areas and look at new ways of doing things. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, clearly we could go on. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, let me mention Roger's book once again, Let There Be Life, an intimate portrait of Robert Edwards and his idea for evolution. Um, details are in the Zoom chat. But I want to now thank all our speakers, Madeline and Nick, Sarah and Gina, Kay and Stappen, Richard and Roger, Jenny and Lara. I also want to thank all our sponsors, the Edward Steptoe Research Trust, the London Women's Clinic Foundation, ReproSoc, Cambridge Reproduction, Theramex and Dr. Byme and the Progress Educational Trust. Thanks also to Dr. Katie Dow, to Dr. Lucy Van Der Veel, um, and to the AV team um, here at Churchill College um, and to the team at the Cambridge Festival. But perhaps particular thanks to Madeline for really organising, administering, convening um, and, and making this afternoon possible. But also um, to you, the audience, for your questions and comments. Normally at this stage in the proceedings, we would adjourn for drinks. Um, I hope you're now all able to find your way um, to a glass of, of wine or whatever is your, your favourite libation. It, it might be too early for wine in Virginia, um, but I hope you're all able to make your way to something and to raise a glass to Bob Edwards and his memory. And with that, thank you all very much. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.